Okay, so I'm just going to give a, a, a brief overview of, of um, what the uh, RADNET grant means. Okay, so um, so as I said, this was this was a, a major um, grant to um, the to Manchester University and in particular to the Christie um, Trust of sixteen and a half million pounds um, over five years. So significant advancement um, to advance radiotherapy um, research here at the Christie. So we were one of seven centres of excellence in the UK who, who were successful in this grant, which is a great advantage because e even though our researchers and our students are situated here at the Christie and everything that that brings, we also have this national and international um, network that our students are able to um, tap into. So a really good support um, network. Um, and of course, you know, an advantage here at the Christie is that we, we have the Proton Beam Therapy Centre, so lots of opportunities through RADNET with that, and of course the MR, MR LINAC machines as well. And really this is all about helping to bring um, the next generation of radiotherapy treatments um, to our patients much sooner and with a much better evidence base. So the aim of this is really to put patients at the centre of our research questions. Um, we want to address research questions that everyday clinicians um, ask. Um, and of course, in Manchester, we have a unique population of patients that already have many um, under or more than one underlying health conditions, so comorbidities, um, which we need to manage in balance with the treatments that we give. Um, taking taking into account uh, their, their underlying conditions and some of the medicines that they're on and how radiotherapy might interact with those medicines. So here's just an example on this screen of some of the um, questions that we hope RADNET can help us to address. So they're, they're very much real world questions um, that, that, we're, that we're hoping to address. And you might have some questions on that as, as we move forward um, throughout the session. So the vision of RADNET um, here at the Christie, it sits in the Radiation Research Unit, the RRU, and our vision is to achieve individual, individualised physical, biological targeting of diverse patient cohorts. So that comes into the comorbidity population that we have here at the Christie using real-time outcomes. And I'm going to touch on that in, in a few more slides, and a deep mechanistic understanding of immune response, comorbidities, and um, genomics. So it's pulling all of, all of those together. Our ethos is that every patient counts. So we want to um, include patients in our research that otherwise actually may not meet inclusion criteria because of comorbidities and other medicine that we're on. So we're very much interested in real world patients that may otherwise be excluded um, from clinical trials. Our approach is very much team science. So we very much come to our research from a multidisciplinary perspective um, because that's the way we treat patients. We work in multidisciplinary teams, multi-professional teams. So why wouldn't our research um, have that approach as well? And that's really when we get the best outcomes. There's three work pack packages um, linked, linked with this, and um, I've already touched on them, but looking at um, the relationship between radiotherapy and immunotherapy, what's the benefit of that dual therapy? Radiotherapy planning with real world patients. So again, getting back to that unique Manchester population um, that we have here and uh, targeting instability and um, looking at the role of hypoxia. So having said that, we have um, four real strengths here in our, our Manchester um, hubs where radio, radio biology sciences um, will, be, will be uplifted through protons, biomarkers, so EMC trials, so um, early cancer medicine trials, we have a very big facility here that looks at early phase clinical trials and looking at that interface with radiotherapy. Clinical informatics, that's where our data sits. And of course, um, the reason why you're all here on this session is for the Radiographer um, Academy, which we're really, really excited about. It's certainly um, the first in the country. 
um, to take this approach. Okay, so I'm just going to very quickly skip through this because I, I have already touched on what the three different work packages are. And, um, and if, if people have a particular interest in any of those work packages, um, then, then we're very happy to take um, questions at, at the end of my presentation or throughout the afternoon. So again, it's the work package on the immune um, consequences of radiotherapy, um, treating complex comorbid cancer patients, and looking at chromosomal um, instability. So this is the ethos um, but behind um, our academy. I think wanting to develop the academy and probably most of you can recognize that radiographer um, research is, is, um, has not reached its full potential. Um, perhaps not enough attention and enough opportunities have been um, given to the radiology, radiotherapy world. Um, and there's a real un untapped um, talent there which is the whole ethos behind wanting to develop this academy. We want to develop in the UK, um, branching out from Manchester, a really strong radiographer um, pool of researchers that we can develop and, and grow with the science. So our plan is, is that um, obviously through the academy is that we will have our masters and, and PhD um, fellows. And we already have, as you know, two PhDs um, currently open um, for applications. And this will very much link into the Christie School of Oncology. So we have a fantastic advantage here at the Christie that we have the only school of oncology um, that is on site on, in an oncology cancer hospital. So there'll be lots of opportunities and support for our students to tap into there. And as I've already mentioned, we have specialised services um, as well, including MR, LINAC, protons and brachy therapy. And um, we, we really want to start to develop that strong research culture and, and research ethos. And you can see who the hub leads um, are there. And I'm delighted um, to, to have been asked to be, to be part of um, the, one of the hub leads. So, um, so this is just reiterating some of what I've just said about the advantages of um, Manchester University, very closely linked in with the Christie um, site, which is obviously where our students will be based. Um, you can see we have uh, the front of the hospital picture there, but if you look up in the top, top right hand corner, um, that's an image of the new Patterson building, which is currently having its foundations laid um, later this week. Um, and we hope that that building would be finished within the next two to three years. And it's, it's a, going to be a very unique um, cancer research facility that is directly linked to a comprehensive cancer centre, which is the Christie. So what I just want to touch on now is um, a little bit about the research group that I developed um, for nurses and allied healthcare professionals. And we've had quite a few radiotherapists and radiographers, diagnostic radiographers um, come through um, the Christie Patient Centred Research Centre, CPCR. Um, and what type of research we do, it's very much about understanding and improving both the patient and family experiences and patient-centered outcomes. And by patient-centered outcomes, I mean um, quality of life, symptom experience, how people um, experience and manage uh, short and, and long-term consequences of both chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So we cover research starting right at cancer prevention through to early detection, whilst people are undergoing treatments and um, through to survivorship. And we also do research in palliative care and end of life care as well. And it crosses all domains of an individual's life. So CPCR was very enthusiastically launched at the Christie um, in 2016, having received major significant investment funding from the Christie um, charity. 
Um, and I think that's an, a real strong message that the Christie are really serious about developing their non-medical um, clinical research. Um, so the launch was very successful. The auditorium was absolutely packed. Um, and, and so it was a very exciting time. The chief executive turned up a few minutes late and he couldn't find a seat. Um, so, so you could say that was a mark of success. And we've just grown since then. I had two researchers working in the team at that point, and I now have a team of nearly 15. In addition, a number of PhD students and master's students within that as well, across all disciplines. Um, so the idea is, is that the academy students would also link in very closely with CPCR. And you can see here, this is a, this is a, um, a diagram of the research strategy at the Christie. And you can see that um, CPCR, Christie Patient Research Group, is a cross-cutting group that goes across radiotherapy, systemic therapy research, early detection and screening, late toxicities and, and surgery as well. Um, so I think that's really significant to, to have this patient-centered research group which um, isn't just for nurses and allied healthcare professionals. I, I also have two medical colleagues employed in my um, team as well, but it really is there to support the clinical academic development for our non-medical workforce. And this is just an example of um, some of the activities that we do to support no, not only clinical researchers, but all of our clinical staff working on the wards, outpatient departments who, who um, may just want to you know, come, come in and see whether or not research might, might be um, something that they want to take on. So we, we have uh, workshops, writing for publication, drop-in sessions, and we support staff with applications for studentships and to apply for their own research funding as well. We also um, have a monthly group called Can Do, where all nurses and research get together once a month and we talk about different research activities and people might present different research that they're working on um, as well. And they've been really, really popular and delighted to say, um, and Cynthia will support this, is that we, we get a lot of people from um, diagnostic and, and radiotherapy coming to these um, sessions, which is great. So I just want to describe what a clinical academic is, because I think if you're, if you're working in a clinical field and you're interested in research, I think we need to move away from to be able to do your research. You have to go and sit in a university. What um, the Department of Health and, um, and the Christie and the university are really keen to do is to support our clinicians to engage in research and to, to stay in clinical research and, almost, and have joint roles, so clinical academics. So you spend some of your time working on research, doing academic work, as well as integrating that with your, um, with, with your clinical time. And that would certainly be a pathway that we'd be wanting to um, support our um, RADNET Academy students to, to follow that pathway. But in the UK, across all of our nursing and allied health professional workforce, um, it's, it's less than 1% of us that are in these clinical academic roles. So way behind our medical colleagues with that. But um, the aim is that by 200, 2030, the Department of Health won at least 1% of the non-medical workforce to be in these joint roles. So a really exciting opportunity. And this is just a, an example of some of the um, people that, that we have supported at the Christie. And you can see we have Lisa there, radiographer, and Amira and Wes, um, radiotherapy, for the radiotherapy department here in the Christie, who we've um, supported with different um, clinical academic um, ventures. And I think some of them are on the line um, today. So I'll have to get um, post hoc permission for using your photos, I'm afraid. But you can see there's a range of different sorts of things that we, we have supported people with there. Um, and I'm just going to finish off with a couple of slides on one project that I'm um, leading on, but it's a trust-wide um, project. And it's the implementation of um, electronic patient reported outcomes. So this is a system where patients can be sitting at home 
and before they come in for a consultation or to have radiotherapy treatment or a follow-up appointment, they can report on different symptoms that they are experiencing so that they can get more timely care. And when they come for their consultation, the clinician is already aware of what that patient has been um, experiencing. So just to show you what that looks like, the system that we have at the moment, but we're doing lots of work to develop this further, um, is the patient would see, receive a text message three days before their outpatient appointment. They'd go through a couple of checks and then they would get asked a series of questions relating to symptoms specific to the um, disease cancer group, whether it's lung cancer, head and neck cancer, and also the type of therapy that they're receiving. And then dependent on how the patient responds to those different questions, they will then get an automated alert giving advice as to what they should do. So here's an example um, for a lung cancer patient and they would be asked to tick which um, type of treatment um, they're in the process of having. And then based on that, they would then receive specific questions relating to their underlying um, cancer as well as the treatment pathway that they are on. And then you can see they go through a number of specific questions then. And if they answer yes, then subsequent questions will, um, will come up so that they can give more detail as to exactly what they're experiencing with that particular um, symptom. So there's just another example of um, asking about anxiety and depression. We also have a question in there about urine in the last 24 hours and the patient can select what color urine um, they, they currently have. And specifically for our head and neck patients, we have um, specific questions about difficulty swallowing. And again, we've inserted pictures um, that just comes up on their mobile phone to, to help them more objectively um, decide which response best matches their current experience. And we're doing lots of work collecting this real world data to see um, what, what benefits it has, although there's a very strong evidence base that, that doing electronic um, patient reported outcome measures does improve quality of life and survival. <clears throat> um, but we're obviously collecting that real world data as we go along. So a really exciting um, piece of research. And I think from a, a radiotherapy perspective, a, you know, real opportunity for us to um, improve that journey for our patients. So I'm going to stop there. I'm very happy to take um, questions or Cynthia, if you're coming back online. Um, yeah, thanks, Janelle. That was brilliant. Um, I think what we're going to do because of the technical glitch, we're already a few minutes behind schedule. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, no, that was great. And it was really informative. I put a thing up on the chat. If you have questions for Professor York or any of our next three speakers, please put them on the chat and we'll try and moderate that during our uh, panel discussion time um, between sessions. So the next group of speakers are um, three established research radiographers with very different backgrounds and who've taken very different pathways to PhDs. Um, and so the first up will be uh, Dr. Helen McNair, who works at um, the Royal Morrison and the ICR to tell us a little bit about her pathway to becoming um, an established researcher in the field. Hello, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me and um, see my slides. Yep. Is that okay? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. yeah, great. Okay, so I'm just um, going to give you a little um, insight into uh, um, my journey. Sorry. So um, uh, I've put the dates up here, no shame, um, in my um, been in radiotherapy for a long time. And um, uh, I, saw, I trained in Belfast in Northern Ireland and then I went straight off to Sydney, Australia and actually um, that was one of the places where I, I learned a lot about um, planning. Um, I don't know how to move that window away. 
gone on mine. Now. Yeah, okay. Um, where I learned a lot about planning and, um, but I think it was, um, I'll go on to say that actually from my experience, it was really useful to have quite a long clinical career before I went into academia, but I know everyone's different. Um, I came back to um, London in 1990 and then um, came to the Marsden in 1992 um, where I spent a couple of years on the, the Linux before I moved into the, the simulator and pretreatment. And again, that's where I spent um, a long time. I think in the simulator, for those of you who remember, you see how patients move, you see how organs move, you see how... Um, of course, we had to use contrast in those days because it was not soft tissue, but you, I really learned a lot about um, patient motion and um, reproducibility and patient setup. And then I came to Sutton um, in the year 2000 to start um, a research post, so that, that's over 20 years ago, and I'm still here. Um, but that has changed as well. So my academic career, just looking at that, when I qualified, I did a diploma. Um, but then when I came back to London, I noticed that everyone was now doing um, BSc degree, so I converted it uh, in a year's course. Um, and then I think my sort of twitchiness must last about 10 years because then I decided to do an MSc. Um, and then I did a, a PhD and, um, and now I've got an Associate Honorary Faculty position at the ICR. But just to go through that, that looks all very, I think, you know, all people might look at that and think, oh gosh, that's very successful, easy, but I'll just go through the steps of that. But before I, I do that, I, I think we have to think about radiographer research and what research we can do. And I do think that um, it's best for us to look at the research where we can answer questions better than everyone else. Um, and when I talked to some of the res um, research active radiographers at the Marsden, we came up with that we're at the, the translational radiotherapy it's technology and patient care. So we're at that patient technology interface. And I think um, for me, that's where I think we can answer questions better than, than any other profession in that um, area. And that's where we are uniquely placed and should be looking at um, ways and openings to do research um, there. Of course, supported by the other disciplines, but again, if we want to um, sort of um, drive and lead research, I think that's the area and the field we should be looking at. So just coming back to my um, research career, I started in the year 2000. It was a cancer research campaign and Imperial Cancer Research Fund before they became Cancer Research UK. So it was a five year program grant and my main role was to implement intensity modulated radiotherapy. So that was radiographer training and patient setup and re reproducibility, which as I said, I'd had quite a lot of experience with in the, in the simulator. And um, I think it was very much the idea of the job was very much that I would um, work with research fellows and um, and implement new technologies and and that's where I started to learn how to do research. So one of the first research fellows was Mark Bolle, and um, we looked at digitally reconstructed radiographs. It seems crazy that we did six millimeter digitally reconstructed radiographs for the pelvis, but we looked at that and three millimeters DRRs. And I remember thinking DRRs were very exciting. Um, but that was something that we worked together and we published a paper. And by doing that and working with him, I learned a lot about the research process, going through ethics, getting ethical approval, filling in um, clinical research forms, um, and the discipline of research. Um, then also because we were implementing an IMRT, I was able to then um, do some research with radiographers looking at the implementation at the coalface and what our experiences were, because at that time, um, we were one of the few radiotherapy centers in the UK that were delivering IMRT. And then there were more physics papers as well. So we, I was working with physicists, again, looking at the, the different techniques of, of IMRT. So just to give you, you know, it's insight, you were working alongside people, you were trying to um, do some research that we owned and then um, also very much in the multidisciplinary team. And then we had the first UKRO meeting in about 2002 and um, the lineup to do the opening talks was David Dernley, Ben Mine here, and um, Charlotte Beardmore, who's a professional, now a professional development officer at the College of Radiographers. Um, David Dernley was running the marathon the day before, so he handed it over to Chris Nutting, and Charlotte was pregnant, and she handed it over to me. 
Um, and by me doing that speak, uh, speak uh, talk, I met Ben Mine here, who was very encouraging and said, why don't you come to Estro? And again, this was, you have to think this was 20 years ago and not many really operas went to conferences like that. And um, without his encouragement and sort of thought of, of why don't you put an abstract into Estro, I maybe possibly wouldn't have done it for a, a much longer time. Um, so I think it's really important to, I think as we get older, then look at, look around at younger people that we can encourage as well and keep um, moving things forward. So the work went on, there were lots of research fellows coming through, so I was doing a mixture of, of um, work like working with the, the BeamCath for reproducibility in prostate cancer as well as implementing IMRT and, and other technologies. So my sort of research portfolio was, was building up. Um, and then there was another um, CRUK programme grant. And by that time, I saw, I'd seen an awful lot of research fellows go through. And I thought, well, why don't I do a PhD or something and try and formalise this? So I applied for funding and it was unsuccessful. And then Alan Horrock, who was um, head of the research at that time, said, we think you should do it anyway. I remember it was a one line email. You know, sorry about that. We think you should do it anyway. And again, when someone says something like that, you just you don't really say, oh, well, change my mind now. I thought, well, why not? So off I went, registered at the ICR and did a, a thesis and assessment of the mobilization and imaging technologies to improve radiotherapy. So again, it was taking a lot of the sort of the, the background, the ground foundation of my work and, and moving that forward. Um, part of, uh, just to give you an example, part of that work was Chris Parker was taking um, biopsies from patients to try and identify patients who would develop aggressive prostate cancer and who wouldn't and inserting gold seeds so um, he was much more focused on on the, the non-technical aspects of this so I then was able to look at the gold markers and prostate radiotherapy and actually sort of set up a, a, a simulated um, study that if we used um, no IGRT what your margins would be if you use bony anatomy what your margins would be and gold markers and then if you did online um, correction and um, what your margins would be um, and this work was then published in the in the red journal and actually it became the sort of foundation for the chip trial margins so I think it is important that we, we do work that we can actually translate into clinical practice um, of course patient outcome is is the um, holy grail but if we can do um, research work that helps us um, implement studies that may um, improve patient outcome, then I think that's where we can contribute. Um, some other work around that time was the active breathing coordinator that I worked with, um, Nikki Panakis. I didn't have a photograph of her, Julie, Judy Christian and Mike Brada. And again, I was looking at the patient acceptability, the motion, the reproducibility, how accurate it was. Um, and um, we published quite a lot of work from that. And then it was interesting you mentioning the um, research um, meetings earlier, um, because uh, one interesting study that, well, I found interesting was looking at um, diet and, um, and in, in the rectum. So I'm trying to see if I can get rid of that. There we go. Um, so we, we try, um, this is Linda Wedlick, who's a dietitian. So again, look outside your professional boundaries and look at, um, there's lots of work about prehab and rehab and um, um, physios doing a, a lot of studies of work like that, that we as radiographers could, could easily pair up with. But Linda and I looked at um, trying to regularize patients um, rectal um, bowel motions by um, putting them on a high fiber diet. So it was a very detailed study, lots of um, food diaries that Linda developed, um, a Bristol stool chart that was always um, interesting. And um, we actually found it, it, it wasn't actually, sorry. Um, so these are the, the stool charts and the patients filled in diaries, which were great. And actually the patients were really compliant at filling these in. And I think we've got a big resource in our patients as well in um, looking at um, patient outcomes and patient um, reported outcomes. So they filled in all of these um, information and we actually find that um, the diet actually didn't um, make much difference to the rectal volume or the cross-sectional area or the rectal diameter. 
we had 22 patients in each group and there was no significant difference. However, we did find gas correlates with rectal distension, which is much, much harder to manage. And I still don't think this question is answered. So any budding research, I, I still think it's out there to be answered properly. <coughs> so looking at where your inspirations to come, I like this quote from um, Newton. And I think at that time it was interesting that all the people who were advising me were all, well, can you spot what's similar? They were all men and there were very few radiographers. Um, so this was 20 years ago. Some radiographers had gone into research posts, but um, historically hadn't stayed, you know, a long time. They just stayed one or two years. So this, these um, were all doctors, Alan Horwich, Mike Prada, David Dernley and John Arnold, and physicists Steve Webb, Phil Evans and Mike Partridge. I were very much my mentors and um, people I learned from when I was working at that time. Um, of course, now I, the, the faces have changed and thankfully there's some women there as well, which is good. And, um, and of course, there's, there's radiographers, many more radiographers around now to help mentor and support and advise, which is, is great. And I think I put this slide in just to say this is one of the most satisfying pieces of work that I was involved in. It was a very good multidisciplinary team, um, Anna Kirby. Um, leading the heart spare breathing study, but because it was such a technical study, um, it, physicists and radiographers had very much, we were very hands on, and um, we had lots of output from this work, and it was successful, and we implemented it and helped implement it around the country. So that, that was certainly something I was very proud to be part of. So back to my academic position, I then applied for associate honorary faculty at the ICR, who hadn't <coughs> had any radiographers do that. So I was um, unsuccessful. So I licked my wounds for about a year and applied again, and I wasn't unsuccessful this time. And, um, and then I did wonder what to do next. And at this stage, someone advised me, I was involved in that, the mentorship scheme at the College of Radiographers, and I suddenly thought, hold on, I need a mentor. So um, Rachel Harris at the college recommended Anne Moore, Professor Anne Moore, who was a physio professor. And I met with her. And I think if a mentor is a really good idea and it's good to have someone outside your hospital or outside your profession. Um, but, you know, my main aim to meet with her is what do I do next? Um, where am I going for this? Will I just coast it for the next 10 years or will I do what else could I do? And we only had one face to face meeting and she said, I think you should go for an NIHR fellowship and this is the clinical academic program. So um, I did and I was successful so I got a senior clinical um, lectureship so a clinical academic post and my um, research is making real-time adaptive radiotherapy possible and um, uh, my clinical side is then working on adaptive radiotherapy mainly on the MR Linac. So I think the most important thing is to don't stop questioning, just think about um, what questions there are to answer and um, also question yourself. What are you, where is your next stop in your career? Talk to people. Um, mentors are, are great, use people with, not use, but um, uh, seek advice from people within and outside your organisation. And I'd just like to acknowledge everyone mentioned in this presentation, Sophie Alexander, who I didn't mention, is actually um, taking over the research position, the CRUK research position, and this is the radiographers on the MR Linac. Thank you very much for your attention. That was terrific. Thank you, Helen. Um, so we'll save the questions to the end of the session, but please put them in the chat. Uh, up next is going to be Dr. Mike Bellick from the University of Toronto and Princess Margaret Hospital who was just a baby radiographer when I was working with him in Toronto, but he's done quite a bit in his tenure as a research radiographer over the last 10 or 12 years. Can you hear me and see my screen okay? Yeah, it looks great, Mike. Great, um, so thanks for the invitation to, to speak. Uh, what I've seen so far from uh, Helen and Janelle is really exciting um, for you guys over there. I'm kind of jealous. I wish we had it, our own uh, RADNET program in Canada. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm gonna describe my own uh, PhD experience and post-PhD experience. Um, and I just wanna point out that um, I know you asked me to 
to speak about um, my journey as an established radiographer, but I still feel very much um, four years into my current position that it's still an ongoing journey and I still don't necessarily feel super established yet. Um, so I'm still working on it. I have nothing to disclose for this talk. Um, so I'm going to describe my progression really from a neophyte researcher, so somebody who had no experience, um, to an independent researcher and a principal uh, investigator. I'm just going to highlight really briefly some selected research projects over the years to kind of show the, the, the variety of things that I've been working on um, and hopefully share what has worked for me um, and, and what hasn't worked for me. Um, so um, kind of like Cynthia said, um, my path in research started very early actually while I was training to become a therapist. And I want to mention that experience because I feel it really set in motion uh, what came after for me. So our undergrad um, BSc program here um, has an optional stream allowing student therapists to complete uh, clinical research projects under um, a clinical supervisor. Now my motivation for this at the time was really to just um, dip my toes into research to see if it was something that I'd even wanted to pursue in the future. Um, and admittedly at the time I did it um, uh, as a way to stand out in the job market as a, only a few other students were doing research um, at the time. So I worked under the supervision of a radiation oncologist, Dr. Laura Dawson, who was really um, an exceptional research teacher, extremely enthusiastic and, and very motivating um, for me as a, as a student. And she really showed me the possibilities of doing high quality research and how that can impact patient care. This was the project I, I was working on um, as an undergrad, and I actually had to complete uh, later when working as a clinical therapist, but we did a prospective study um, modifying mobilization masks for head and neck patients, um, demonstrating that the accuracy was not necessarily compromised when we removed a lot of the material over the low neck, um, but actually skin toxicity was a lot lower because we removed that buildup material. So really, it was just a, a very practical project for RTT practice. Uh, and personally, it was immensely very satisfying to see that the research um, we can do can impact patient care directly. And actually, we're still doing this here at Princess Margaret um, over 10 years later. Uh, so I practiced as a, as a therapist at uh, Princess Margaret in Toronto. Um, and, and even before I started the clinical practice, the environment I was in was very academically focused, um, where research, including research by radiotherapists, was, was valued. So just to explain that a little bit more, this is a snapshot of where, where my clinical department looks like right now. So we're a really large group. We have about 160 um, RTTs at any given time. Nearly a quarter of the staff have graduate degrees, actually. Unfortunately, only two of us have doctorate degrees, so I'm hoping that's going to increase in the future, but still a large portion have gone on to do research degrees. And 10% um, are um, cross-appointed with the University of Toronto, so they can engage better in teaching and research. Um, and the figure on the right is uh, from a colleague of mine, Tara Rosewell, showing that um, um, actually, research RTDs can be very productive. So this is this is kind of the cumulative number of um, peer-reviewed articles from therapists, either as first author or senior author over the years. And you can see we we're already at uh, over 200 papers um, done with senior authorship or or sorry significant authorship by RTDs. So overall, a really um, academically focused clinical uh, and productive clinical department. Our department also had a really um, a lot of success with research therapist positions over the years. So these are typically funded through large grants um, that give RTTs protected research time, um, sometimes really sustained protected time over many years. Um, so I was hired by a physicist, Dr. Christy Brock, who was working in a really uh, cutting edge field at the time, developing deformable image registration tools. So um, working with her and her team, this really required me to gain a new knowledge outside of RTT practice. Um, so I gained that on the job, and that was in new areas um, such as biomechanics uh, and mathematics and so on. Uh, at the time, those tools we were she was developing were very early, preclinical, um, not necessarily practical for clinical use at the time. But as one of the only lab members with significant direct clinical experience and direct patient care experience, I really felt that uh, my contribution as a therapist was important, especially as someone who would be one of the kind of few end, uh, future end users of these novel tools. 
Uh, so I was lucky in that I was already working in a, in a fantastic research environment at the time as a research therapist with a great project, um, a great diverse lab members, um, some were clinical, some were not clinical, um, and a great supervisor. And for me, this was pretty um, easy, no brainer um, to start doing master's work because I was already, I already felt like I was doing master's quality research. I really wanted to just kind of formalize it and get the degree recognized for it. So I enrolled in a master's program initially, um, and my program permitted transfer to a PhD without necessarily completing the master's program. Uh, and I did that because I kind of had some early publications and some early success doing a PhD. Um, and, and admittedly, I mostly decided to do a PhD at the time because the opportunity was there. I didn't necessarily think too far ahead in what uh, I was going to do with the PhD. Um, in hindsight, I don't know if that was necessarily the best thing. It seemed to work out overall, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. Um, my advice at the time of people to talk to. So at the time, there were um, no PhD trained therapists in Canada to talk to, to really get advice from on, on, how, on what a PhD could do for your career. So, so I was left talking to people um, outside the profession. Um, and, and just to kind of backtrack a bit, um, how you dif differentiate what you're getting in a master's versus a, a doctorate. So in a master's course, you're really just getting your formal research training and a PhD um, takes it a little bit further um, as you're trained to become more of an independent researcher. Um, so again, since I was already deeply engrossed in research work, my transition um, initially to full-time master's student was relatively easy for me. The challenge for me was funding again. So um, not that there wasn't scholarships available, but it was um, a hard sell personally to kind of um, step back away from full-time clinical practice work and that salary and those benefits to becoming a full-time student again. Um, so uh, fortunately, my, my uh, clinical department was very accommodating. I was still able to work part-time as a, as a therapist, so I could still keep up my clinical skills um, and also generate some income. And I really made a priority to find my own funding. So I applied for like literally every scholarship and grant I was eligible for um, to supplement my income. And I was, I was fairly successful over the long run in doing that. Um, as I mentioned, it was a full-time program for me. So um, other people, I, uh, some colleagues were doing kind of online studies because that worked for them personally. I decided to go um, all in full-time. So really to do kind of a, a classic kind of grad school experience for me. Um, and my program uh, was at the Institute of Medical Science at U of T and it was very much a research focused program. So very few courses and emphasized um, um, thesis work. So that's really suited me um, very well. Again, I was lucky to have a really great supervisor who I already had established a good working relationship uh, with. And I can't stress enough how important that is when you're in grad school, that you need to find the right um, relationship with the supervisor. So again, I had some um, you know, other students and other colleagues that were also doing grad students or master's degrees. And you can kind of see when the, when the fit isn't right with the lab and the, and the supervisor, you, you can kind of struggle a little bit. Um, so I would advise um, future grad students to kind of really look at it, if it's the right fit or not. And also for me, um, working with Christy, it was really the right balance of teaching and offering support, but also somebody who, who really challenges you as well. Um, and of course, working on projects that hold your interest for five years or so um, helps too. Um, so this is one representative paper I did um, from some of my work as a research therapist and also my PhD. So we were interested in using these deformable image registration tools to estimate um, the actual doses we delivered from patients. So we actually modeled um, um, organ deformation that we see on cone beam imaging. Um, so this is an example for liver SBRT. We can calculate dose on these images and then really compare what we deliver um, from what we initially planned. And we, the study I showed that actually in the majority of cases for liver at least, given how much motion and deformation happens, sometimes we are uh, very off course from what we intended. So after grad school, um, I kind of suddenly found myself with no research job. Um, and at the time there was, in Canada at least, there was virtually no options for um, PhD trained therapists. Um, so I was a little bit stuck. 
Um, so I was encouraged by my previous mentors and, and supervisors to do a postdoctoral research fellowship. Uh, and the rationale being that, you know, I could kind of be more competitive in the field, in, in the researcher field, if I did more training. And I was kind of convinced that, you know, you know, physicians and physicists also have to do more training after their doctoral degrees. So kind of analogous to like a clinical residency or a fellowship in oncology or physics, a, a postdoc could really allow you to do more training um, uh, as a researcher. So postdoc is kind of an odd transition time, I must say. Um, if you're doing, you're, you're doing your own research, um, driving much of it on your own, but you're still considered a trainee. Um, and you have this underlying feeling that you're kind of sort of on a probationary period as a researcher and a scientist. So it's, it's kind of almost like a, a one to two year job interview. Um, officially, you're, you're practicing independent research under the mentorship of somebody who's already established. So I was working under uh, David Jaffrey, who is a senior physicist and scientist here at UHN, uh, doing my postdoc. Now postdocs, again, there hadn't been any other um, PhD trained therapists in Canada who had done this before. Um, and postdocs, at least in North America, are, are kind of the standard if you're looking for a tenure track faculty position, at least at research oriented institutions. But it was very unusual for a therapist um, for me to be doing a postdoc at the time. Um, so I did it at the Techna Institute and decided to focus a little bit more on what I had been doing previously um, and focusing on research in clinical medical physics. So I wasn't become a physicist, but I had just been orientating my research towards medical physics um, in that site. Um, and in hindsight, a postdoc was actually a great opportunity. Um, and it allowed me to demonstrate and prove my abilities to potentially people who would be hiring me later. Um, so you, you have potential autonomy as a postdoc um, without a PhD supervisor hovering over you. Um, you can really kind of um, choose your research direction and, and it allowed me to have an opportunity to lead some projects and even supervise, started to supervise, at least informally, other researchers and students. And of course, it gives you more time to establish your publication record and start applying for grants as well. Um, and for me, the, the most important thing that um, I got to do during my postdoc was really build my network, um, both in academia and also in, in industry as well, that helped in later years doing research. And it allowed me to find champions later when I, um, uh, in terms of um, people supporting um, RTTs as independent investigators. Um, so this is just, uh, again, to show kind of a, a different type of uh, paper I did um, during my postdoc. So rather than just looking at dosimetry that I was doing in past um, research projects, um, this is an example of a study where we're actually linking planned dosimetry with outcomes. So we were trying to relate um, liver SBRT plans to patients who actually um, developed liver toxicity after treatment. Um, and then translating that into new planning objectives that we could use in the future to help avoid toxicity in patients. So just a little bit of a different flavor of research. Um, and, and during the end of my postdoc, I really started becoming more vocal in what I wanted to do with the leadership uh, here at UHN. And I had help from my mentors and supervisors um, echoing my message as well. Um, and I started collecting other job descriptions that my organization had been putting out for kind of allied health um, scientists. So again, it didn't exist yet um, in radiation therapy, but my organization did have a few AHP slash scientist roles coming out in other professions like physical therapy and so on. So I really started collecting all those um, and started developing the, and speaking my message of, of what I ideally wanted to do um, here. Um, and actually, I ended up drafting what my ideal job description looked like and started to really kind of pitch it at my organization that this is something that they might want to invest in, again, as a starting off point, because um, the position had never existed before. Uh, and eventually, a new job opportunity was created um, in the radiation therapy department, um, and it was done under the direction of Ellen Moyo, who's the current director here. Um, so this position um, was posted that I was successful in obtaining, at, which is a radiation therapist, clinician scientist. I think this is analogous to what um, Janelle was, was showing before. Um, and really the mandate, or my mandate, is to create and maintain a research program, an independent research program in precision radi radiation therapy um, in alignment with our, our own strategic objectives. 
and the idea is it's supposed to be the majority of the time uh, research protected time with with a number of clinical duties. Now, obviously, you can uh, expect that the, that's going to ebb and flow, and sometimes it's much more clinical than research. But the idea is is really focused on on academic practice. Um, I have a cross appointment with U of T, so that again allows me to engage more in teaching and supervising students, and also an appointment um, at a research institute, which allows me to apply for um, federal research funds. Um, so my experience so far um, uh, has been very positive. Um, again, it allows me to lead and, and contribute in a really unique way to translating new technologies to the clinic. So some things that I've been uh, involved in over the years are kind of translating the research of the formal registration into, into kind of clinical practice um, and dose reconstruction. So again, estimating delivered doses um, and comparing that to planned do doses. Um, these are tools that we're starting to use more and more in clinic now. Um, we also have an MR Linux that I'm involved in and, and setting up strategies for adaptive radiotherapy. Um, I do supervise some research therapists as well. Again, those come and go when the funding come and go, comes and goes um, and, and currently have a number of undergrad students that I do research with as well. Um, applying for grants is, is, is now a regular part of the job. Um, I can say I've had a number of failures, uh, but also some successes too. And I think that's pretty typical uh, when we speak to any PhD, um, definitely outside of, of the radiographer profession, um, but that will happen as well. Um, as you know, getting grant funding is, is very competitive these days. I think um, my number one challenge of the past few years is really positioning um, and, and developing the messaging of, of what I can contribute as an RTT researcher. And, and I, I'd say that in the field. So, you know, in the in science in general and from the federal funding landscape, if you have a PhD, you, you know, you're well equipped to do science. But in radiation oncology, I still feel like there's work to be done um, on the messaging on how a therapist with a PhD can contribute to the science. So what I've been doing over the years um, a lot of research that that might be considered, you know, physics research. And, and vice versa, a lot of other physicists and oncologists have been doing research that could be considered radiographer research, and there's a lot of overlap. But I think the number one opportunity um, for us as PhD trained therapists, and this is what El, um, Helen said as well, is, is we are positioned um, well to ask the questions that are most relevant to RTT practice. Um, so this is kind of a, a just highlighting some work that's been going on for a few years and is, is still being done is, is something I'm involved in, is trying to develop what kind of the next generation RTT model of care looks like. So this is kind of a schematic on, on what on, on our practice, at least here in Canada, mostly is it's very linear. The patient interacts potentially with lots of different therapists over the course of, of the trajectory of their cancer care. Um, and that's not necessarily good for patients. There's lots of handoffs. Um, um, so there's issues around patient safety and, and patient experience as well. So we're, we've been developing over a number of years and we've tested this in pilots. It's actually partnering patients with a single therapist that actually um, um, can deliver treatment, plan their treatment, image the patient and provide supportive care and follow up. So it's, it's, it's reducing the number of handoffs for patients. We think will really improve the patient experience, but we actually think it's going to be really important as we do more um, complicated strategies like adaptive radiotherapy or integrating other modalities such as immunotherapy um, into, into radiation. So again, we've done, we've done this on a number of a uh, couple hundred patients in pilots. We actually have a, a clinical trial that should have been initiated now, but unfortunately is on hold due to the pandemic. We're actually going to randomize patients um, to receive different to receive RTT in different models of care. Um, so I'm excited for that in the coming year. Uh, what's, what's worked right for me? Um, again, um, just hammering home that message. I think finding the right fit with the supervisor, the lab and the mentors is really important. Getting comfortable with failure and rejection is gonna be part of the job if you're gonna be a scientist. Have a plan as much as you can. I necessarily didn't adhere to my own advice, but I think especially as you're, um, into your PhD, you start to start to um, network and see what post PhD life is going to look like. Collaboration is really important, uh, especially post PhD when you're trying to build your own research program. So you won't have necessarily the support of a supervisor to guide you. You're really going to have to step out of your comfort zone uh, um, and collaborate with people. And then continuous self learning. So again, I'm I'm 
constantly trying to learn a new research methods still um, uh, that support new um, directions in research. Uh, so to summarize PhD trained RTTs, I think it's becoming a more viable career path now. Um, I think we are going to face similar but also unique challenges compared to other researchers, but um, we can make important advances to science um, and cancer care. Uh, so thanks, that's all I have. Uh, I'm happy to take questions or, or roll to the next speaker. That was great, Mike. I think um, if we put the questions in the chat, we'll deal with them after uh, Dr. Yat Sang, who's our next speaker, finishes his talk and tells us about his journey. So some of you know Yat, he's um, done a lot of research with uh, RTTQA, uh, quality, and um, some really interesting stuff in radiomics. So Yat, will you share your screen and uh, tell us about your journey, please? Yeah, thanks, Cynthia. Does it look okay for everyone for the screen? Yeah, that's great. And so um, thanks, Cynthia, and thanks for the organizers for inviting me to be here for the event. And so um, it's always quite tough to do a presentation after Helen and Mike. So if Mike calling himself as an early researcher, then I wouldn't call myself as a baby researcher. I think that would be more appropriate. So um, hopefully I will be able to share some perspective about uh, my research journey so far. So um, the overview of the talk, um, just a bit about my career path and why did I decide to do my PhD, something about my PhD thesis, and also the, about um, what have I done after my um, finishing my PhD. Um, so my career path that I don't mind sharing my years as well. So I graduate uh, for my bachelor's degree in radiotherapy in 2002. And then I moved to the UK, um, kind of tried to do some um, so searching and consolidate my career and uh, so I worked in radiotherapy for pretreatment, planning dosimetry and the treatment delivery as well. And in 2006, and I completed my MSc in healthcare informatics and I decided to change my career to be involved with um, the uh, radiotherapy trials quality assurance group in the UK. And in 2014, I decided to go back to clinical. So I applied for a consultant and practitioner job at Mount Vernon again. And so that will be uh, my current job. So from my personal perspective about doing a PhD, um, so it kind of go back to when I'm employed as a trial care radiographer within the RTTQA group. So um, for the job that I was employed to do that, you know, I kind of um, got the opportunity to design and implement QA programs for clinical trials that require the effective introductions of advanced radiotherapy in the UK. So as Helen mentioned that, you know, in the UK for the last decades, there's a lot of changes and there's a lot of rapid progress in kind of the uh, treatment planning and delivery within radiotherapy. So I think this job that coming with a very good opportunity for me to explore the aspect. And then, so um, with the job that, you know, over the eight years that I was in RTTQA, I was quite fortunate enough to be involved in uh, a lot of different collaborative projects with um, a lot of um, kind of clinical experts in the UK. So um, when I come back to my clinical jobs and then that I got asked the question says, uh, what do I do with this? So then I decided to do a retrospective um, PhD by published work at my uh, local university as London South Bank University. So what is PhD by published work? So um, it is a thesis that comprise uh, kind of a, a including a sole or multi author works that have been submitted or accepted for publications. So it offers an alternative route to the award of a doctorate, um, but all the other regards, they will meet the standard as a traditional PhD as um, Helen and Mike kind of detailed. So um, for me to go back that, you know, it's kind of thing of a research questions that I can put my publications under the same umbrella. So the research questions that I come up with for my PhD thesis is about, is there a role of trials QA that influencing the development of evidence-based practice in advanced radiotherapy? So they come with three different research aims. So um, we try to answer the research questions through eight um, kind of publications that I was involved in, which I will go through that later. So um, first, which are aims is about, you know, um, the development of a national radiotherapy dosimetry audit on the implementation of advanced radiotherapy. So I use three of my publications that involve in that sense. 
So since 2010, I think there's a number of UK centers that adopted the, radi uh, the rotational, um, rotational intensity moderated radiotherapy. So in general terms, that require to be met for clinical use. So the RTTQA group that, that will be just kind of required to adapt the existing uh, MRT credentialing programs to cover this new technique. So we kind of um, performed the first national dosimetry audit of the VMAT. So it's a collaboration between the RTTQA group, the IPEM, and also the National Physical Laboratory in the UK. So the three publications that I mentioned that, you know, we developed a novel treatment planning test for credentialing a rotational uh, MRT or a techniques in the UK. And we developed a methodology of how to do a dosimetry audit on this technique in the multi-center setting. And the last publication is about, you know, actually the result of the multi scientist dosimetry audit of this new technique in the UK. So on my thesis that, you know, we try to kind of prove that, that we're able to generate new knowledge to illustrate how the first UK national dosimetry audit can develop and facilitate through evidence-based uh, evidence practice. So we move to the second aim, and then you know we look at about how can we utilize the trial radiotherapy planning dosimetry data to support the development of advanced radiotherapy. So we correlated the trial radiotherapy planning dosimetry data collected as a part of the QA program within a clinical trial outcome data. So the trial that I've been using in the publications is the, um, the FAST trial, is a FAST radiotherapy for breast cancer trial which is the kind of the phase two trial before the fast forward, which we just seen the publications in Nonset um, this year about the five actions in whole breast radiotherapy. So um, the first publications that we've used is about, you know, uh, looking at the breast size, you know, is it a risk factor for laser advice effect of breast radiotherapy? You know, what is the correlation of the kind of the dose and planning data for that? And second, we look at the kind of the impact of those uh, kind of the inhomogeneity, mostly that requires hotspots on the plan on the late normal tissue complications after the kind of the hypofractionated whole breast radiotherapy in five fraction settings. And the third one that we look at is like about the quality assurance analysis of about how um, kind of the fast trial centers, how compliant they are to the kind of the trials protocol as a UK multi-center trials. So for these three publications that it provided new evidence that, you know, the use of advanced radiotherapy technique can be a major contributor factors to the successful implementation of hyperfractionations in breast radiotherapy in the UK. So the last research aim of my thesis is about the analysis of the influence of the trials QA on the implementation of advanced radiotherapy. So I included two of the publications that I was involved in. So, um, so, um, as I said before that, you know, in the UK, the RTTQA group has carried out quality assurance for several breast radiotherapy trials, uh, either phase two or phase three. So um, we did a descriptive survey research to illustrate the influence of trials QA on clinical implementations of advanced radiotherapy. So um, the first publication is on about looking at if, the, uh, if, if taking part in clinical trials influence the implementations of new techniques in radiotherapy of breast cancer. And the second, we're looking at specific trials that I was involved in, looking at the clinical impact of import high trial on breast radiotherapy practice in the UK. So from these publications that, you know, suggest that trials QA can be seen as a catalyst for implementing new radiotherapy technique by providing support and guidance to centers. So, it's just a quick overview on my thesis so far. And um, so then, you know, um, people may ask that, you know, if there any big changes in life after the PhD, um, because I got my clinical job, so I would say that not really, um, but all Mike mentions quite important is about um, your clinical mentor and the kind of the research you're working with. So Emma and Vernon are quite fortunate enough that I'm working with Professor Hoskin. So, uh, Prof always asked me that, you know, what's next and what do we to do next for after I finish my PhD. So I try to summarize some points that, you know, I've been doing or trying to pursue after my PhD life. So I try to enhance my publication records and then try to uh, look at the different results and outcome data with those image data with the existing funded research. 
Um, I try to sharpen my clinical and industry skills, and then I try to add an extra layer from the academic setting as well. So luckily that I've been involved in a local university at South Bank, so I would do some MSc student supervisions with the aim of looking at um, professional doctorate and, and PhD students supervision as well. And, and trying to increase my independence as a researcher as well. And hopefully I will develop my own research project and then involve in writing research grant funding applications. So um, I think Mike and Helen kind of uh, and, and mentioned in the talks as well. And I think um, it's quite important that we're able to establish our research network and then get to do a lot of different collaborations um, with different um, uh, kind of researchers that you met, you know, that we're able to stimulate and actually will nourish the research projects that you want to do as well. So, you know, able to take part, or should I say, to learn from different researchers, and then we're able to take the strength, and then so hopefully we're able to develop the strong research in a, a more comprehensive way. So, in conclusions, and um, if you after this um, event, you're going to ask yourself, is it worth to do a PhD? I would say, yes, go for it. You know, you've got perfect opportunities here. You've got two kind of fully funded PhD opportunities and the CRUK Rednet HHP Academy at, at, at the University of Manchester. So um, for the past few years, they actually are quite lucky to get to meet a, a few researchers that, you know, at the University of Manchester. You know, they're brilliant scientists, they're brilliant researchers. So you've got an opportunity to meet with them and work with them. And I think you should just, you know, take the chance and go for it. That was great. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks for the plug. <laughs> um, it, we have the next 10 or 15 minutes to answer a question. So if maybe um, our three speakers from this session and Prof York, if she's still with us, can turn their mics um, and videos on. Um, I don't see anything coming up in chat yet, but I might just kick it off. So the next session that we're going to do is um, having highlights from uh, earlier career researchers, so people who still haven't quite gotten over the hump of successfully completing their PhD. Um, do you guys have any top tips for people sort of at the beginning of this journey? Um, I mean, I think for me, it was certainly much different uh, when I started this 16, 17 years ago than it is today and the perspective changes. So any top tips for some of our speakers in the next session or people wanting to apply to these PhDs? Don't be shy. Um, I think I can say, I think, um, because um, Cynthia, I think for, for my PhD, I was done as part-time. So I was keeping my uh, kind of clinical jobs, which may be slightly different um, to the kind of the full-time PhD uh, opportunities. But um, I think for, um, for the researchers who is doing their PhD part-time, I would say that, you know, um, we will go into a quite a tough period of time in the middle of when you're writing your thesis. And I would say that, you know, hang in there, don't give up. You know, eventually we see the light of the tunnel. And then I think it's worth it when you complete it. Yeah, yeah, and I was going to say the same thing, whatever route you choose, don't give up. Um, and um, I think for me, I really enjoyed being, keeping close links with the clinic. And um, part of that reason is why I've gone for the grant, which is the clinical academic position, because I think that that keeps you sharp, it keeps you knowing what's current. Um, so even if you are going to do a PhD full time, keep your links with the clinic somehow. I agree uh, as well. I think it's really um, how we're going to be uniquely positioned. Um, we're going to have to stay very relevant in the clinic as well um, as we as we build research careers. Um, advice during PhD. Uh, I, this is not my quotes from somebody else. I don't know who, but it's write early and write often. Um, myself, I was a brutally slow writer for all my papers and my PhD, and I probably could have completed the whole thing. Uh, a year faster if I had a reasonable writing pace. So um, get it done early. And, and I think if you get the papers out early, at least for me, it helps um, a lot when you're going to defend your PhD as well. Great. Um, okay, so then, um, so, so Helen and Mike certainly touched on this and yeah, you sort of inferred this. So there is a bit of discussion about uh, positioning us as uh, clinical radiographers 
uh, and the message about what type of research we can and should be doing. Do we, I think there was definitely a link through all three of your talks and even through some of my work, which is again a little bit different than what you guys have done. Do we think that this is coming together? Do you think that uh, formulating a, a joint message will help us uh, move the momentum on in this, in this type of work? We've got to see the value of the work we do and um, yeah, just focus on the, um, yeah, just stay true to uh, the, the work we're doing and believe that there is value in it. And I think with Echo Helens, I think, you know, when you're doing PhD, I think, you know, you do kind of plan, actually, you need to spend actually um, quite a massive amount of time on a specific subject that you're going to work on. So, so you know, definitely that it was something that you find relevant to your clinical work and then you're interested and you're passionate about. Otherwise, you know, you'd be quite difficult that, you know, you got stuck with a subject that you hated for five years, then, you know, that would be <laughs> very difficult to finish it off. Great. So we have a, we have a message from Elizabeth. She says, for part-time clinical and research roles, do the speakers have any advice on protecting that research time? I think it is hard. I think it's try, to try and build some sort of structure in. I do think you end up being part-time clinical, part-time research, and then part-time everything else. So it does seep into your whole life. Um, but that's lots of people are like that. Um, I try and make some distinctions, like wear a uniform when you're clinical, work from home when you're not, or go and hide where you have to do your work or your planning or whatever. Um, but it is inevitable that the research role is more flexible in terms of time and the clinical role is more demanding in terms of patients at that time. So that's just something you have to live with. Does it help to get um, your uh, clinical supervisors or management on board early on in the process, like during the application process, to help identify how this may or may not work? Yeah, possibly, but I think at the end of the day, on the day-to-day -day basis, it's got to be you and your judgment. And I think if you've got you know, good colleagues, but if they really need you, then you step in, and then at other times you step away um, and try and take that time back. Yeah, um, definitely. I think, um, as Helen said, you know, I think a job plan will be very important. And I think, based on my own experience, and I, you know, I, I, I will raise my hand up. And sometimes I think I do it myself, and because sometimes I use my clinical work as an excuse as well. So you know, I think if you've got a job plan, I try to stick to it. You know, a lot of time that you know, and 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 I, I would say that I'm too busy of clinical work. That's why I'm not going to do any research. And I think it's, it's about your mindset that you know, if you've got a job plan and then stick to it. You know, ensure that your research output is stick to the timeline that you set out to, so you're able to finish your kind of your thesis in a timely manner. So I think that would be the advice that we would give for the part-time researcher. Great. Um, and then we have a question from Professor Fafin asking to the full-time research teams, do you have any advice on keeping the close relationships with the clinic and ensuring clinical re relevance of the research? So the, I guess the flip side of what we've just been saying. I find that difficult to answer because I've always I've done a part-time clinical or a clinical academic position. Um, but I guess it's, again, it's being visible. It's maybe working sometimes in the clinic. I, I don't know, maybe yet, or I might get better advice. So I can say for myself, um, even when I was doing uh, studies and I was working part-time one day a week in the clinic, the other four days a week, actually, my research was still based in the clinic. I've always been doing research in the clinical setting. So, so I've had a lot of visibility with staff still, um, you know, still going to clinical QA rounds, research rounds, you know, integrating as much as possible with, with, the, with the multidisciplinary staff as much as you can, even though you're not directly treating patients. That has worked for me. Um, and even now in my role, um, I don't do any, um, by, work, by virtue of the, the clinical work here, therapists are unionized. So I, I can't actually do any of the, that kind of clinical work, but my desk is still right in the middle of the clinic where actually most of the other 
leadership team, physicians and physicists have actually moved offsite. I've actually remained in the clinic. And for me, that's been really important because I don't do that clinical work. That proximity um, has been really important for me. Great, and from, thanks guys. And from uh, Jenna, any advice on how to choose a research project or where to look for inspiration? Mm -hmm. Um, I would say there are two just out there that's been <laughs> advertised. So I think, you know, that would be a very two, I would say that very clinical and then and as a very clinically relevant projects that has been proposed for the two PhD opportunities at the kind of University of Manchester. I think the truth is too, um, you know, potential PhD students don't necessarily get to pick their topic, right? A lot of it's driven by funding. So, um, and, and unless I'm mistaken, that kind of the RADnet program and the funding mechanism is sort of um, at least loosely guiding where those projects are going. So, um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing as well. You know, as, as researchers, and I'm finding now uh, in my position, your research has to align with where the funding is, is, is the truth. And then um, from Professor Van Herk, uh, he's asking that RADnet is for a large part about biology. What opportunities do you as experienced RTT researchers see within this grant? Um, or in other words, what um, ideas for a new RTT projects should we write next? Mm. So yeah, you do a lot of radiomics. Is there anything there that we could, you know, combine, do you think? And, and I think to answer that, I, um, I think I tried to kind of um, follow what Mike suggested in his talk as well. I would say that it will be based on the individual's interests and abilities and also the strength as well. Because I think, um, I think if we see it as, you know, we're all healthcare scientists, I think, you know, that we've got a research questions that we want to answer and we try to establish uh, a method to answer it. So I don't think that we will have the kind of a, um, a clear cut about, you know, this project is purely for clinical oncologists or this project purely for RTT or this project purely for physicists. So, and, and I would say that, you know, it will be, you know, if that individuals that got specific interest in a certain topic, I think they should go for it. And then, you know, and, and, and try to sharpen their skills and then, you know, and kind of, um, as Mike said that, you know, we just carry on developing ourselves and to ensure that we will be a more rounded researchers in the field that we're interested in. I think the I think the key is going to be for kind of the up and coming uh, and established RTT researchers is again to to see the interface between the patient and these new modalities. Um, what role can we specifically develop in therapy? So you know, if we're, look, if we're talking about comorbidities, how can therapists support that? Is it going to be therapists either assessing patient or or establishing the patient relationship to get patient reported outcomes, you know, what really narrow um, tool do we have to develop to get high quality data to study, you know, immunotherapy, radiotherapy um, interactions? Or if it's not with the patient interface, you know, what other, you know, facets of therapy do we have to develop um, to study immunotherapy? So if we're studying imaging, I'm just trying to think of my own work. So, you know, studying doses we're delivering to organal, you know, organ subunits, for example, how does that show up on imaging the, the, the and, and how do the biological changes show up to those subunits on imaging? So we're just gonna have to really like, um, to move the needle, so to speak, on the outcomes, I think we're gonna have to really double down on some of these like narrow facets of therapy. So is it gonna be the patient, patient reported outcomes, or is it gonna be more of the imaging and technology stuff? So I think that's probably the, the opportunity for therapists to really develop, I think. I think that's coming quite well to link into myself big data project. So, you know, all these things that Mike mentioned that, you know, can all link into myself's project in big data. I was going to say, Marcel, you're just asking us for all uh, ideas. I would, um, I would think, you know, yes, maybe sure. sometimes we need to stand back and think about how we do things differently. And I, I think that's a lovely example of what Mike was talking about early. Or, um, with hypofractionated radiotherapy, how can you know, we can look at the whole pathway of the patient and how can we deliver that differently instead of just trying to um, log into what we've been doing for 30 fractions? I think it must 
it must be very it got the opportunity to be very different another idea again kind of plugging into that last project i was talking about um moving to this new model of care where we kind of have a, a single therapist overseeing all these facets of therapy part of the the impetus for that was that we expect you know with new therapies coming online like immunotherapy um treatment trajectory is going to become a lot more chaotic it's not necessarily going to be linear plan scan treat it's going to be you know changing and adapting um, as the patient's responding treatment so having a therapist oversee all that complexity and guide the patient through i think is going to be really important so, so that's kind of one angle we're trying to uh, address um, uh, now kind of building the foundation for that That's great. Um, if there's no more questions, I'd like to thank our speakers once again for giving us their time and sharing their experiences. And um, I would imagine if you wanted to reach out with further questions, they'd be receptive to hearing from you. Um, so I think with that, we might move on to the next part of um, this event and hear from some slightly newer uh, research rides, some who've been research active for a very long time, but all certainly who are sort of still in the process of um, applying for or completing their PhD. So we'll start with uh, Mark Warren, who works at the University of Liverpool in the radiotherapy education program there and is uh, working along the NIHR pre-doctoral and doctoral pathways. Hello there. Um, can everyone hear me and see the screen? Looks great. Brilliant. Okay, well, Good morning. Um, I'm Mark. I'm a lecturer at the University of Manchester, um, University of Liverpool, even. Um, the research that I'm interested in is 4D MRI guidance for stage 2, 3 lung cancer. But I'm going to try and talk to you about where I am with this research and where I'm going with it. Um, I'm a therapy radiographer, um, and a lot of people in Manchester know me because I was an advanced practitioner there for a, a long time and I specialise in uh, treatment planning, brachytherapy. And actually it's that job that really got me interested in research. I got first um, involved in research for the first time and um, when I moved to um, the University of Liverpool I was really keen to keep that clinical research connection. So my, my um, job role there is, is um, primarily in teaching um, but I've had a lot of support there to try and keep um, some sort of research connection and um, since 2016, I've been um, beginning to um, make connections with uh, the established researchers there and also the, the, um, the treatment centre there, Clatterbridge um, um, Centre of Oncology, um, and to look at um, focusing some research on MR, um, for, um, MR guidance of lung. And I've been really fortunate to um, get some funding um, through um, the College of Radiographers. It's been really um, key to establishing um, the, the research I've started and just as you're going through just so you've got an idea of where I am in the, the PhD journey I, I'm part-time and I've probably done well probably well, well under a year of whole time equivalent research so far so I'm just going to try and give you enough sort of a flavor of what I'm interested in now in, in terms of research and where I am so when I was a um, advanced practitioner I, I a lot of my time was spent planning lungs and I was well aware that for this these stages of lung cancer we had very large radiotherapy planning margins which were probably um, influencing the outcome of the way that we we're, were treating patients so we're given a lot of dose to the big um, sort of the critical organs in the thorax and I was also aware that if we could improve the accuracy and precision of those treatments then maybe we reduce those margins and um, my research has focused on that so particularly I've been interested in um, the respiratory motion of, um, of lung cancer and also the positional changes so the tumors moving with breathing but also we expect perhaps some drift as well over the period of treatment whether that be over days or over time and of course the respiratory and positional movement overall is, is going to change with every breath a little bit. So 4D MR guidance is quite an interesting if you're interested in, in, in movement because um, and I'm sure that you're going to hear some of this in the MR um, lectures to follow um, the, this good definition of soft tissue but also 
moving away from um, giving ionizing radiation means that we can do additional extended imaging. It's going to give us an opportunity to really map how the tumor is moving and also see at different time points the variations in that. Um, and you could implement MR in several different parts into the radiotherapy pathway as well. We could um, replace some of our CT or give additional MR at the planning stages to sort of give an idea of how the tumor is moving. It's maybe perhaps more accurate. We perhaps monitor changes to the, um, to the motion and position if, right before we treat with an MR LINAC and adapt our treatments. Or perhaps um, also, which is completely different to our normal sort of CT way of looking at things, we can monitor with MR during treatment and perhaps change the treatments based on um, if the tumor moves outside an expected position. So there's all this potential, but the real question I wanted to get down with, to was, well, we, we can see a lot more and there's lots of potential to do extra stuff to the patients, but will it really mean that there's some sort of meaningful improvement to the precision and accuracy of the treatments if we start adopting some of these new ways of working with MR? So, the last, um, the last sort of year or so, I, I've been working on a few things with the, um, to do with my PhD. Um, one of them is getting quite technical with the MR, I've been attending MR scans and, and helping develop, uh, establish what sort of research sequences we need to run, and also um, working through a methodology for sorting, collecting, and also testing the accuracy of the MR sequences that we're, we're, we're going to use. So. Um, very briefly, there's sort of two um, sort of sequences we're probably going to be, well, we are going to be looking at in our clinical study. There's one sequence that is sort of akin to what we use at the moment, which is on the left for CT, which is where we, we take a whole load of slices of, um, through the thorax with MR. We sort of retrospectively order them to get a sort of 3D stack of the tumor and its motion. The other one is this, um, is the way that we're going to have to look at um, our tumor motion during um, real-time adaptive radiotherapy and we're only able to image a few cross-sectional sizes at a time so we're going to have to try and work out how we're going to establish um, the 3D motion of the tumor from from that and other MR images. Um, as I said there's a, um, I've been working on setting up a, a patient study um, and that's now recruiting. We're, what we're doing is we um, 20 um, patients and we're taking additional MR images for the MR arm images at two time points. First time points at um, planning stage so we can compare our um, 4D MRI images against this current standard of 4D CT and then we're also taking some images in the first week of radiotherapy. But crucially we're taking a lot of imaging in those sessions so we're leaving gaps so we can repeat the images so we can build up a big picture of the the motion and the position of the tumor over um, key time points of days and then uh, minutes which would re um, relate to the pauses between adapting our treatments and delivery and also over seconds as well to try and get an idea of how the tumor would move over the seconds that we're get delivering the treatments. So um, the outputs from my PhD, hoping that we're going to get some really detailed information about the extent of tumor motion and being able to um, and the accuracy of tumor motion um, that we're we're seeing on 4D MRI, so we can compare it to our standard at the moment of 4D CT. I'm also hoping we're going to get real some real detail on um, tumor geometry motion over those time points. Um, I'm hoping to look at some um, the tracking error involved in monitoring tumors over a few slices, and all of that I'm hoping to feed into um, some sort of uh, um, sort of idea of how much we can reduce those planning margins and what impact that's going to have to the dose, the critical organs, and the tumor dose. Um, and um, very speculatively, where do I want to be? Well, I'm hoping this, that this um, research is going to have some impact out there in the clinic. So I'm hoping that maybe there'll be some supportive evidence for introducing 4D, 4D MRI into the planning stages. So all centers can perhaps be using MR for their lung patients if it's necessary. 
hoping that it'll aid some development of t um, for the MRI for techniques on the MR LINAC. And maybe that in turn will, will support design and develop of new MRI guided phase, um, phase one and two trials as well. And overall as well, there's quite a resource impact on this. So I'm hoping that by looking at this, we're able to sort of get a really good sort of evidence-based idea of how um, we should be using for the MRI for long treatments. Okay, thank you. That's great. Thank you, Mark. Okay, so we'll just um, keep proceeding on. Our next researcher who's nearing the end of her PhD journey is Ashley Tequino um, from the Royal Marsden ICR. Um, so Ashley, are you ready to share your screen? Yeah, I am. So can you all see that okay? And hear me okay? So looks great. Okay, great. So I am a therapeutic radiographer in the final year of my PhD. So I'm currently writing up. And essentially my research is a dose response study looking at the relationship between toxicity and accumulated dose to the rectum during prostate radiotherapy. I started my PhD in January 2015 after winning a fellowship from Prostate Cancer UK, which was in partnership with the College of Radiographers. But really my PhD journey began in 2012 with pulling together the proposal for the grant. And that took probably about a good eight months. Um, I submitted the proposal in 2013. And then in 2014, I was invited for an interview and um, was awarded the grant. So it was quite a sizable grant. Um, it covered my salary for three years and obviously the associated research, research costs such as training and IT infrastructure. So I didn't come to my PhD with a strong background in research. Um, I'd always been interested in research. I got involved where I could, but I wasn't a research radiographer. I'm a treatment radiographer and I'd moved into clinical education. My master's was in leadership and management and health. So other than treating, uh, pa treating trial patients, my research experience was limited to a service evaluation. So if you're thinking of, of applying for one of, the fellow, for one of the fellowships, but you're concerned about your research experience, please don't let that put you off. The object of a PhD is to train you to be an independent researcher. And I learned a huge amount just putting the proposal together and going through the grant process. So I had this amazing grant and I knew it would be tough, but my intention was to complete my PhD in three years. So I had this um, very lovely Gantt chart that said I was gonna collect my data and analyze the results in two and a half years. So I was gonna start, as I said, in January, 2015. And that would leave me six months to um, basically write up and I could submit in December, 2017. Now, in reality, um, I'm sure many of you have seen this um, depiction of, of what a PhD uh, is like. There's peaks and troughs. And um, in hindsight, trying to complete a PhD in three years as a research novice was uh, perhaps rather ambitious. Um, so at the end of 2017, I had collected most of my data and generated most of my results, but I found myself in positioning position where my funding, you know, for my salary had, had run out. Um, so I returned to a clinical post and uh, I continued to write up the thesis in my own time. So just uh, some of the considerations, um, if you're thinking about starting a PhD, it's a very different working pace. It's, it's a vocation as well. It's not a nine to five job. So you will work evenings, you'll work weekends, maybe even holidays, but that flexibility works for you as well. I found myself feeling slightly isolated in the beginning um, because I was very used to the camaraderie of the team environment. So I reached out to different, uh, to other PhD students from physics and from, um, the medical staff and I found research networks which were really helpful. One of the other things that I struggled with initially was going from being this expert um, you know in, in treatment 
to being a novice again. Um, I'd always had this very strong professional identity and, and I kind of, uh, I, yeah, I felt a little bit lost initially. A big challenge for me throughout my PhD has been my health. So I had periods of ill health um, and in 2018 I was diagnosed with a chronic health condition. I had to take an interruption to my studies. Um, so I've only recently begun to write up again. Um, and the reason why I'm telling you this is because three to five years is a, is a long commitment and um, there will be life events along the way. But the research institutions are well aware of that. There are support mechanisms in place to, to, to help you. Returning to practice as well, um, as I said, I did my, my PhD initially uh, for three years full time. I hadn't really been in the clinical environment. So returning to then as a team lead um, in 2018, it, it had some, it required me to upskill quite quickly. Um, and then obviously trying to write up in addition to work is tough. It's like having two jobs. Um, it is manageable. I've just had to very much improve my time management skills and approach uh, writing up with a different mindset. Uh, I also reduced my working hours to four days a week. Um, and that, that helped as well. But obviously then you get a slight drop in salary. So why do it? What's the benefit? Well, um, as AHPs, we're well placed to identify gaps in the evidence base. Addressing those gaps helps us to improve patient care and service delivery. And we need people to undertake that research. Doing a PhD develops you as a researcher. That's not to say you need a PhD to be involved in research um, or conduct it, but doing a PhD gives you this amazing opportunity to completely immerse yourself in your project. And that's almost a luxury. Um, it has been tough at times. I don't regret doing it. It developed a different skill set, which has um, certainly been useful going into practice. It's, it's, um, yeah, it's improved my practice, and that's obviously you know contributed to job satisfaction. So next steps, um, as you've heard from the established researchers, there are a number of different avenues. Um, academic or translational research, education. You could even look at being a grant holder for um, one of the charities or move into the private sector. For me, my only thought is in finishing my thesis. Um, my, uh, yeah, I can't think beyond that at the moment. Um, I'd just like to thank my supervisors and also Prostate Cancer UK for their support. Thank you. That's great. Thanks for sharing, Ashley. So I think um, we'll keep moving on, but remember to put your questions in the chat so we can have a chat with the panelists um, at the end of the fourth talk. I think up next we will ask uh, Aileen Dufton. Aileen, are you ready to present? So Aileen is partway through her PhD journey and she's a research radiographer uh, just north of the border. Um, so she's going to tell us about her journey. Okay, hello. Okay, can you see that there? Yeah, great, thanks. Okay, so um, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, today I'm just going to talk about, um, first of all, a little bit about my career so far and also about the PhD that um, I'm undertaking. So um, first of all, um, I've been a research radiographer um, for about 11 years now. Um, I had completed an, a master's in advanced practice in radiotherapy and oncology at Sheffield Hallam in 2013. Um, going back to something that Helen said, um, initially what my job was was implementing new technology and there was very little infrastructure in terms of research um, for radiographers in our department. So initially that was about implementing new technology and then it gave me an opportunity to start publishing on things such as service evaluation. Um, I would then, um, as I developed a bit further, um, I started to look more at the research aspects of the career and um, started and to have been a chief investigator and principal investigator on some of the locally developed studies. Um, that's allowed me to sort of publish work um, as CI and PI as either first author and senior author. So that's kind of been my publication expertise so far. 
um, I've always thought it's really important that as radiographers, when we do a piece of work, that we do take it through to the full publication and presentation of the work. So that's something that I do try to encourage um, those that I work with to do. Um, I've also worked um, with Estro and also with YAT um, um, on a piece of work um, with Estro looking at advanced practice. And I really do try to promote advanced practice and research within our um, discipline. Just to introduce you a little bit to our team, I'm delighted to say that we've got a growing team now. Um, it's again, with, although I've got two other radiographers working um, alongside me, Lindsay Devlin and Lisa Hay, um, it's still not easy um, even now, even with an established career. Um, I think the team is a really essential part of developing good quality research and it's really important that us as radiographers really have a good multidisciplinary team approach and build on those multidisciplinary teams. As I said, I really do like to champion radiographer-led research and do encourage this, um, everyone I work with to make sure that they have their own ideas and take them forward and develop their own studies. But again, it has, is still a challenge after 11 years. Um, I think it's also worthwhile mentioning that that multidisciplinary team relationship is really important, especially in terms of having good peers, mentors, and even just people who do encourage you. So in Glasgow, we have worked over the years to have a strategy where we look at um, specific tumour types. They include head and neck, uh, um, pancreatic, um, neuro-oncology, and also um, lung. So I think by defining that sort of um, areas of expertise, then it's really good on building the multidisciplinary teams that are going to support us in our research. Um, so the reason for doing my PhD was really just to formalise my research skills and um, the thing that struck me was that I really wanted to be a better mentor and supervisor. So having done um, my own masters and that being extremely useful in developing research projects, I really felt that it was necessary if I was going to lead a team that I would bring it on to the next level and actually develop my own skills and also be a very good role model within that. Um, I signed up for my um, my research degree at the College of Med Medicine and Veterinary and Life Science at the University of Glasgow and I'm about 24 months into the PhD. Um, I have got sort of two main supervisors, Professor Anthony Chalmers and Dr David Chang. Um, you probably know Professor Chalmers who is um, a radiobiologist and then um, Dr David Chang is actually a, um, a surgeon. Um, Dr Derek Gross is my clinical supervisor locally um, and he is extremely supportive. It's really important to have that clinical link. So um, I think some of the, um, some a few people had mentioned earlier how they got to doing their um, following a particular path or a particular um, I guess topic. Um, so it, go, it goes without saying that pancreatic cancer obviously has extremely poor um, outcomes, and whenever we look at how much um, those outcomes have changed over the last few decades, then there's been very little progress in terms of improving survival. So it seemed like quite an obvious um, choice for me, and that was really driven by my interest in that particular area. Um, it also was driven by the fact that there are so many unanswered questions in abdominal radiotherapy and a lot of areas it needs improving. So I guess for me it was a no, um, no brainer that we would take this forward as one of the main um, research topics. Um, I had um, and I am a research post and I'm fully funded by the Beats and Cancer charity and that's a real privilege to be um, funded by this charity, especially over the number of years that they have provided um, support for this role. Um, it, was, it then became sort of like an obvious, um, I guess, funding opportunity that I would apply for um, university fees through the Beats and Cancer charity. Um, what I did was filled out a full application and included like a full plan of what the three years work would look like and what that research programme would be. Um, and as I said, that proposal was based on my own ideas where um, I had seen like a number of ways that we could optimise radiotherapy for this particular patient group. Um, so just to give you an idea of how my research fits into the bigger picture, we really do have like um, a great infrastructure for pancreatic research in Glasgow. And um, 
as I said, um, there's been a number of researchers who have built a massive program looking at um, laboratory and translational work. Um, the Precision Pank platform um, is a way of taking every pancreatic cancer patient um, under an umbrella where they will be screened and they will be directed to the right clinical um, trial. It means that they can look at molecular profiling and also look at um, outcomes and circulating tumour DNA and so on. So it means that we have got an opportunity to get every, as much information from every patient that comes through. And that just gives you an overview of a lot of the work that is going on within that particular platform. And radiotherapy is a small part of this. However, so my, my PhD is focused on improving the radiotherapy protocols within the primus studies that are within the Precision Pank umbrella. Um, I've had a great deal of input into the development of like, the radiotherapy protocols for, um, for a couple of local studies. Primus 002 is actually looking at neoadjuvant reg regimens in the resectable and borderline cancer, um, rectal um, pancreatic cancer. Sorry, hold on a second. <laughs> Just need to turn something off. Um, so I've had a, quite a lot of input into the development of the radiotherapy protocols. Um, and being included as a co-investigator on the studies, it's given me a great opportunity opportunity to give input to the trials management groups and also learn a great deal about trial design and so on. Um, so again, although it is a small part of these studies, the radiotherapy aspects, um, it's just really important that we do develop really good protocols within trials, things that are standardised and optimised so that we can hopefully make a difference to these patients. Um, I'm also involved in the Pioneer study, which is actually a phase one study looking at a laparib in combination with chemo radiotherapy for the locally advanced pancreatic cancer group. And the reason that um, I have um, become involved in these studies rather than actually taking my own studies through research governance is because, um, as you know, there's probably there's not so many pancreatic pa patients who come through that we could recruit. So instead of competing, what we've done is used our optimised protocol within these studies. The research questions um, I have are based on the below areas and really they are, they're defined based on the technology that we have. And the three main themes is looking at how we optimise the delineation process for pancreatic cancer, how we improve on the treat, on treatment cone beam CT image quality and improve our soft tissue matching, as well as um, looking at the feasibility and accuracy of using surrogate structures for soft tissue matching. Um, at the Beatson, we have, um, we're quite a large centre, we've got 13 to 14 linear accelerators and we've got mainly true, beam, um, true beams and true beam STXs. We've got the capability of using a six, six degrees of freedom couch, triggered imaging, we've got an SDX spirometer, gated cone beam CT and gated treatment. And we're also about to um, have our own dedicated MRI for radiotherapy planning. So again, we've got huge opportunities within this um, te technology um, to improve outcomes. Um, a lot of the work that I'll be doing is based on motion management and the different um, ways that we can optimise motion management and improve um, our radiotherapy protocols and also looking at MRI protocols, um, what sort of acquisition, what sort of setup and so on and help us to quantify and mitigate motion for patients. Um, we also are having a look at PTV and OERs, um, improving the sort of visualisation of PTV and OERs within cone beam CT. And given that um, it's still a standard of care in a lot of centres using um, standard linear accelerators, we really do feel that um, improving these um, images can actually help to improve um, the way that we actually verify treatments. One of the important things I would say has been building up like um, our profile within the multidisciplinary team and that's been a big, that was a big aspect in the first year of study and um, looking at how we build those relationships within not only the local team with the oncologists and physicists but also how we engage with a wider multidisciplinary team. So I'm um, attending multidisciplinary team meetings with surgeons, radiologists and nursing staff at other hospitals. Um, it's also um, been important um, that we have built up trust with the um, trials management groups and been able to contribute significantly to the design of certain protocols. And we've also worked really closely in our department with diagnostic services and we really look forward to keeping those relationships going whenever we have our own MR um, CT scanner. 
So um, I guess that um, moving forward, then it's really important that for paving the way for other radiographers, that this becomes the standard practice in our department and that we do remain um, a significant part of the multidisciplinary team. Um, there's been plenty of challenges along the way. Um, I, um, I think um, a few of the other um, presenters today had talked about keeping up with clinical work and so on. Um, I've, I chose to do my study in full time, but I've almost tried to keep a full time job as well. And that's been really, really difficult. Um, I think that now having a bit of um, reflection on it, it's important that you actually do um, try to separate the two things. Um, but again, it's work in progress. There are lots of other opportunities out there and I am part of CTRAD and ESTRO and I have quite a number of different roles within ESTRO. Um, as I said, I, was look, um, I looked at the advanced practice position paper with YAT. Um, I'm part of the um, RTT committee. Um, I also play a role in the Education Council and the ESTRO School. Um, and I've, I would have been chair for the RT2 track at ESTRO 2020 earlier this year if it hadn't been cancelled. So there are a number of things that are going on with um, sort of professional development as well as PhD. And that's um, something that I felt was important throughout um, this time. So that's so, me so far. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Aileen. That was great. So our final speaker for this session, so keep your questions coming through the chat, is uh, Wes Doherty, who works with us at the Christie. He's been research active for a very long time and is sort of on the pre-doctoral uh, pathway and is going to share his research journey with us. Hi everyone, my name is Wesley Doherty and I'm a therapeutic radiographer at the Christie. I am by far the most novice um, researcher I think you're going to hear from today. So it's been really, really useful to hear about the pathway and the journey that everyone else has been on. Um, so for me, um, I'm going to talk about, oh, I'm just going to talk about um, where I'm at the moment and where I'm moving forward. But most of what I'm going to talk about is where I've come from. And it was really useful to actually hear from um, Mike, Helen and Yat um, about how their research um, journey was strongly informed by what um, happened to them either during uh, training. Uh, in the case of um, uh, Mike, when he said um, he did a stream in research as part of the BSc and uh, just looking at Helen, how she'd worked in practice for such a long period of time before going into research, which is, is really, really useful. Um, so if we look at my um, previous uh, background, so I qualified as an optometrist in Dublin in 1999 and worked in that role for about 17 years. At that stage, um, I was starting to become quite used to what I was doing. It was becoming quite easy and didn't challenge me anymore. And I felt that was quite a dangerous place to be because I was worried I might become complacent or um, start missing things or being left behind. Um, there was there was some opportunities there, but there wasn't anything that I was really interested in. And it was a bit of a challenge to find something that would um, be interesting to me. It was at that stage that I decided I would do um, radiotherapy. So I graduated as a postgraduate uh, in radiotherapy in uh, 2014. And I worked at the Oldham and Salford uh, Satellite Centres at the Christie. In 2018, I started a, a secondment in education and uh, I later went on to secure a permanent role, which is what I'm doing at the moment. I did worry initially that by stepping back from the cold face and not being 100% focused on clinical, that I might miss out on um, the patient contact or I, in some weird way, naive way, I felt that I wouldn't be delivering the same level of care to patients unless I was on the front line. How in education could I improve care for patients? It was really useful for me because by stepping back, it gave me a much bigger overview of what else um, is happening in the patient pathway and allowed me to make changes, not just to the individual patient that I would meet, but in terms of training broader um, cohorts of staff to deliver that better care on a day-to-day -day basis, basis across a broader range of patients. I did worry a little bit as well that if I was to go into research, would the same thing happen? But my experiences in education actually reassured me. And that's something that I'm going to come back to in a couple of minutes. So if I take a step backwards, I qualified with my postgrad in 2014. And uh, just in clinical practice, I noticed a couple of things that just felt like perhaps there was other approaches that we could take that would um, improve the care that we're giving to patients. I'd worked in a previous job for 17 years and had been able to make some small changes um, because I had more of a leadership role um, within the organization. Whereas 
starting as a novice, I didn't feel that I had that skill set necessarily. So I did notice a few things were happening, didn't really know what best way to, uh, to approach them. I did my MSc in 2017, and that was really useful because I was able to look at some of the uh, challenges that I'd observed clinically and see if I could come up with uh, ways that would um, be beneficial. In reality, I didn't actually get that far, but I got a much better idea of what was informing some of the um, behaviours or some of the actions that I had, uh, had seen in, in practice. So that was really useful to educate me as to why things were happening, but it didn't actually improve patient care or didn't actually change anything. So I was left a little bit stuck thinking, I don't really know what to do here. It was at that stage that I came across the uh, Health Education England National Institute of Health Research and um, Integrated Clinical Academic Programme. And that is a five-step programme that goes from internship at one end, which is for novice researchers, all the way up to senior clinical lectureships at the other end. I guess for uh, when Mike said earlier about um, doing the research stream, um, it wasn't necessarily something that he wanted to do at the time, but the opportunity came up uh, and he found it really useful and, and now has a very successful research career. For me, um, the internship was probably that moment. It hadn't come up during my initial training, but for me and for anyone that has been qualified for any length of time, it was a really useful introduction to getting into research. And at my internship, I was able to build upon the work I had already done um, for my master's, which built upon the anecdotal observations that I'd seen in practice before that. So it seemed to me that this was a natural progression. So going for my MSc in 2017, I then did my integrated clinical academic internship in 2020. Um, so that was really, really useful for me. I did think um, when I went into education that there was, um, a, would research really be the thing for me? But I did think the same about education as well. It was the same thing I mentioned for education by stepping back. I had a bigger overview, had um, more insight into what was happening in the wider, wider organization. And I started to look a lot more at the four pillars of advanced practice. So I already had a background in um, education in my job role. I had a background in clinical um, experience from when I worked um, as a radiographer on set from 2014. Um, and I had looked at leadership when I went into my education role. But I had identified that research was one of those areas that I wasn't all that strong in. And that, again, is where the integrated clin clinical academic internship came in very handy because I was able to keep my clinical aspects, but also to build upon them with the academic aspects as well. In my case, I felt it was really useful to have the education um, arm to that as well and to be aware that there was opportunities for me to develop within leadership. And that goes back a little bit, I think, to what Janelle said earlier when she um, was speaking about um, research. Um, the opportunities within RADNET are to support uh, research, uh, clinical, but also to look at research leadership. So I guess that fits in quite nicely with it. So for me, the integrated pathway um, is probably looking at all four pillars because um, there's certain areas I've identified um, that would be beneficial for me moving forward. Um, after completing the internship, um, the next step is to uh, apply for a PCAF. So a PCAF is a pre-doctoral clinical academic fellowship and it forms a bridge between um, my previous MSc and applying for a PhD. So it'll give me the opportunity to identify any weaknesses and to come out with a competitive PhD application at the end of it. I've been probably fairly mindful throughout this talk not to particularly talk about the area that I'm interested in because for me, I'm more, uh, more interested in the experience and it's been really useful hearing about the other, they're called novice researchers, but honestly what um, Mark and the others have done is, is way ahead of me. Uh, but listening to them and listening to the experienced ones, uh, listening to their journey is probably the most interesting thing for me because it's those shared challenges and those experiences that um, I feel that I could learn most from. I am aware though as well, that there's a lot that I need to learn from a research point of view. And for me, I'm acutely aware that I don't know what I don't know. Um, so hopefully um, on the PCAF pathway and from um, the uh, experiences of talking to the researchers um, before me today, uh, and perhaps even getting their contact details and networking with them, um, it'll help me to identify areas of myself that I can build on moving forward in order for me to reach the level um, of, of being able to apply for a competitive PhD. Um, so further down the line, uh, an opportunity for me is to work um, towards getting a PhD. Um, and that is just to round out all four pillars of advanced practice. Uh, I'm doing a leadership course this year. Uh, I'm doing education at the moment. I've got my clinical background. So research is an area that I definitely feel 
uh, will just make me more rounded overall and give me a better insight into um, improving uh, wider patient care, not just locally, but uh, perhaps on a national or international level. So my research journey, I think, has been an incremental one. It was informed by my previous ex experiences in my previous careers, so then some anecdot anecdotal observations in practice, built upon that with the uh, MSc dissertation, again built on that with the Integrated Clinical Academic Internship, uh, and I'm looking forward to the next step of PCAF and beyond, uh, where I can build on that work and then uh, use it to actually implement real and meaningful change in the future. And all of this is supported in the wider setting uh, of the four pillars of advanced practice. Thank you. Terrific, thanks um, to all of our speakers. So if maybe uh, the four speakers from this session will turn on your mics and your video so we can see you and ask you some questions. Um, and if the audience will continue to type in their messages via chat, um, we can have some discussion. I think um, all four of you and our three previous speakers touched on the importance of collaboration particularly interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary collaboration. And a lot of that has stemmed from uh, the requirement for mentors. And there's not a lot of research mentors already in our profession. But do you think we're reaching a point where we can start to mentor each other and mentor others? And do we think this is a really important step forward in having our voice heard as RTT researchers? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, without a doubt, we can be the one who is either mentoring each other. In fact, we can even mentor people from other disciplines too. Um, I think that's one of the reasons um, I believe doing a PhD would be worthwhile is to be able to be that mentor, be that supervisor and give very good advice to whoever was coming through and be able to encourage them. Great. So we have a message from uh, Alastair. He says, how can we better recognize experience from previous careers and how relevant could this be to a research experience? Okay, I think that's aimed at me. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> um, so I think that's a question that I asked myself when I went into um, radiotherapy initially. I thought I'm brand new in this. Everything that I've done before um, is completely useless. In fact, probably about 90% of it was transferable. The talking to patients, um, the uh, working in teams, um, the clinical side of things, patient confidentiality, all those sort of things about improving service were already there for me. Um, so I think it's, it's probably um, within each individual to have to challenge that as well as uh, wider organizations. Um, I guess the, the, the wider organization things will come from Cynthia and above, so I'll bounce that back to, to you maybe. Um, but I think we need, uh, I guess we've got a role as educators as well, um, working within radiotherapy. We recognize the skill sets that other people bring in. Um, so I think it's about reinforcing um, the value and the transferable skills that people have. So just an, an anecdote that I can tell is um, we've got a lot of staff who are new to the Christie that we do inductions for, and they're quite worried about working in a cancer environment. and um, Sometimes when we talk about previous careers that they have, they'll say, oh, I've just worked in Tesco or I've just worked in, in McDonald's. And I love when people say they've worked in Tesco or they've worked in McDonald's because their patient facing skills, their people facing skills, their difficult conversations and um, their interactions with people um, are really, really challenged in those environments. Whereas working in a cancer environment, we don't have the same challenges, but that means that if it does happen because the patient is stressed, these members of the, the members of staff are really well placed to actually challenge that. So I think there's loads of transferable skills that can be brought across. I think it needs to be something that's addressed at every level. So um, when the, when the um, uh, members of staff are new um, or the uh, researchers are new in their post, um, it should be uh, brought up at that stage and I think it should be supported by um, the, their mentors moving forward. Great, we have, uh, I'm going to leave it there because I don't think I can add much to that Wes, but um, I think uh, Professor Chaudhry has put a question through and I'm going to get each of you to go through it in turn. She says, what has been most challenging about your research or PhD studies and what makes it most worthwhile? So I'll start at the bottom of my screen. I have Mark. It's most worthwhile. Wow. Um, it, it, it's, it's amazingly sort of satisfying and rewarding to think about new things. I think I, I, I really enjoy that aspect of it. Um, and it, it's great to know that when I'm doing that, that it, um, it, it's, it's going to contribute to something bigger as well. I, I think that's a really, you know, a, a real important thing for me. Chal most challenging aspect? Um, 
there's there's quite a few. <laughs> um, I probably um, so funding for me is 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 a challenge. So um, I have to balance uh, the funding that I've got was a, was really enabled me to sort of engage with the people at, at Clatterbridge in the clinic. Um, that that was really important for me. Um, but now I I've also got to balance a job where I'm teaching. Um, takes up a lot of my time with um, with also the research so I, th I, th I think probably it, it is probably the um, well I, I suppose everybody has to balance things I suppose what people are getting at with in many of these talks is that um, with the sort of the satisfy satisfaction of of doing something that is is new and interesting and exciting is that you can't just leave it it's, it's always there with you even if you don't want it it's sort of perhaps there in in your head uh, so I suppose it's the uh, it's both a blessing and a curse in a way if you if you want to get away from it. Great, Aileen. I think what's been um, quite challenging for me is that because I chose to be part of other people's studies, then sometimes I'm not in control of this, the speed that things happen or the recruitment to things. So um, I guess having had experience as of having a being a chief investigator and a principal investigator, you have much more control over that aspect. So I think um, that's a bit of a challenge for me. But I think I've managed to sort of find ways around these challenges, and I guess that's part of the learning experience. And the uh, most rewarding part? Yeah, the most rewarding part is, I guess, being um, seeing yourself sort of reflecting on how you um, sort of think about things and find ways to overcome challenges and also becoming that expert where people do come to you for advice and things. So that's kind of quite a nice um, sort of outcome from it. Brilliant. Ashley? So I think um, Mike mentioned this before, uh, writing is my challenge. I struggle with writing. I drive my supervisors mad with um, when they've seen drafts of my chapters. Um, one of the top tips I was given was when I started was to, to write, to start writing early. It didn't matter what it was to start writing early and I didn't do it and I, I wish I had listened to that. I think it would have been a big help now in trying to um, basically write up a, a really complex body of work. Um, what makes it worthwhile? I mean, it is hard to stay motivated when you're trying to, to balance two jobs, but I think the multidisciplinary, you know, the collaboration, and also it's, it's really exciting when you see your results. You know, you've spent so long collecting this data and analyzing it and, and it's, um, yeah, it's really, it's thrilling to, to actually get some results through. So I think that's what makes it worthwhile for me. Terrific, and Wes? Um, I think the most challenging thing is me, to be quite honest with you, because <laughs> um, there is that element, I think, always of self-doubt and imposter syndrome, which I know can be quite common against uh, academics, if you have mentioned that to me. Uh, and I find that really interesting, but also really reassuring as well, because it, it normalizes a little bit and takes away some of its power. Uh, and I also mentioned earlier that I don't know what I don't know, so that can be a bit of a challenging thing as well. If I know the areas that I need to focus on, I can put a plan together. But if I'm blindsided by something, then that's a bit of an issue. And I guess that's really where the mentors comes in, come into things. Um, by utilizing your mentor, having those conversations, it's easier to tweak those things out. Um, the most worthwhile things, I think, um, is uh, pushing my boundaries. Um, and challenging myself, which might sound um, counterintuitive to what I've just said. But um, my previous career in, radio, in um, optometry wasn't really challenging me. Um, so I took a co complete career change and went from a privately paid job to an NHS funded job uh, and everything that goes with that. But it's um, always been really rewarding, really valuable for me to see myself grow in that role. So um, I think pushing my boundaries and challenging myself is uh, something that really excites me about the idea of, of moving in towards academia. Terrific. Great answers and great presentations all. And thank you very much for your time. I think we've all learned. I've certainly learned lots. Um, and thank you to our audience for sticking it out. We have one more session to go before we talk about PhD projects. I hope people are taking comfort breaks as and when, um, and you're not waiting for me to uh, provide those. Um, I think we'll just move straight on and uh, meet some of our radiographers working in research here at the Christie um, to highlight some projects that they've been working on. So the first 
Uh, we have Lisa McDade and possibly Lindsay Cooper, uh, who are going to give us a short presentation about some work that they've been doing in MR Sim. Um, so we were we were quite in a unique position of setting up an MR Sim service, um, only the second in the UK to be specifically within a radiotherapy pathway. And this was housed in the proton beam, the new proton beam centre. Um, there's very little evidence in the literature about which sequences to use for radiotherapy planning. So we essentially set up the service using evidence from the uh, radiology evidence base and optimised them in accordance really with the on-site uh, radiologists, clinical oncologists. But what we wanted to do was audit the image quality and just ensure it was appropriate for radiotherapy planning. So we have started, so I'll just scroll up to the methods. We reviewed the head and neck patients imaged in the first few months of the service opening, and there were, uh, there were 16. All, all our patients were imaged in the treatment position. You can see a graphic of treatment position there. One uh, complication that you probably know about using MR is we can't use conventional coil configurations. So we, we have to make do around, around the patient with flexible coils. And that does create some problems from a, from a physics point of view. So all our patients are in treatment position in their masks. Sequences use for a combination of T1 and T2 weighted. Different tissues in the human body are more conspicuous on different uh, MR sequences. So consequently, you need a combination of, of sequences to make a protocol hence the need for four that, that we, we, um, we used. Uh, patients were imaged axially from superior orbital margin down to sternal notch. And for our, for our audit, we used a, an absolute VGA. We felt that that was the most reproducible tool. We used a, a Likert scale from one to four, going from very clear to not visible for a list of predetermined structures, and they were the structures that were the uh, OARs and likely to be needed on the uh, treatment for the treatment planning. So our results, overall scan time was uh, just under 32 minutes. The mean in room time was 64 minutes. Um, it, it's a long time, the, the setup takes quite a long time. If we go to table one, that was the, uh, the, the composite VGA scores. And we can see that just under 70% of the sequences and structures were acceptable for use in treatment planning. And they were ranked very clear or clear. As we said, different body tissues are seen on the different weightings, hence the need for the combination of a few sequences. We then broke down the, the uh, structures and we can see when we look at table two for structure clarity, the overall between the four sequences, all structures scored at least 78% clear or very clear. So in conclusion, uh, reviewing a newly developed MR SIM service by using this, VG, this absolute VGA um, has allowed us to start to implement continual quality improvement processes we can compare the performance of individual sequences and that's allowed us to identify some sequences that might be eliminated if we want to make way for, for new sequences as they're developed. This, uh, th this tactic sort of, it, it allows us to ensure that protocols are up to date, they're evidence-based and we've got a, uh, some sample images for you to see there, T, T1, T2 and a, a, a T1 FATSAT. Uh, future aims, we've started with head and neck and we will move on to the other sites that are treated with proton beam therapy over time. And that's, that's the end. Thank you. <laughs> that was great, Lisa. Thanks for that succinct uh, description of your project. So this work has been accepted. It would have been presented at Astro this year, um, which is why it's in poster format um, by Lisa and Lindsay. So, uh, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. Is David Roberts in the room? He is indeed, and I've, I will just, I'll sure. keep, re keep sharing screen and I can just flip on to David. 
So David works with us in our proton therapy department. He's not specifically a research radiographer, but he is very research uh, keen and research active. And this is some work that he's led um, in the new center. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so this is about the assessment of setup accuracy using VAT bag systems. Um, it was primarily done in a proton beam therapy department, but the results are relative to standard radiotherapy. A VAT bag is a, is a VAT bag. Um, so to answer this question, we looked at three main areas. Um, they were timings, um, so that was setup times, image review times, and total treatment times. Uh, we also looked at cone beam CT image displacements to see how accurate the setups were within the VAT bag. And then we also looked at um, the image agreements between 2D and 3D imaging. Um, we've got quite a unique, um, or we had quite a unique imaging collection process when all this data was collected within the, the proton therapy department, um, which you can sort of see there. So we've got image, three images before we start treating the patient. I'll just go through that now to give you a bit more background about to the results. Um, so, so we settle the patient as normal, and then we proceed to image one. Image one is an initial 2D Im image, just to check for gross error, um, just to make sure the patient is in the right position. We make, make no moves off this image. If we're happy with that image, we'd then proceed to image two, which was a cone beam image. Um, this is our gold standard image. Um, we'd apply the moves off this. We have quite small tolerances on this image of 0.1 centimeter and 0.2 degrees. So moves will almost always uh, be implemented, um, as in this cohort uh, of patients that we had here, 100% of the images had at least one measurement out of toll. So, so every time we, we applied the moves, and then once we applied the moves, because of the manufacturer requirements of the bed that we're using, we have, we have to then take another verification image to make sure that the bed has moved to the right position. So we've got a three-step imaging process there. Um, so, Moving on to uh, oh, so a bit of the data collection. So what sort of data were we playing with? So we also did the first 10 patients within the department that came through the department. Um, and that took six months. It was quite a slow ramp up. So the data was collected, collected between December 2018 and July 2019. And from that, we had four GA patients who were supine, six non-GA patients who were prone. Um, all the patients were treated in the pelvic and lumbar region. And then we had uh, quite a lot of images to play with from that, where there were 299 initial 2D images, 181 cone beam images, and 180 verification images. Okay, moving on to results. Uh, so starting off with timing results. Uh, so we broke down these into three areas as well. So we start with um, setup time. So this was the time taken from the patient entering the room to the initial image. Uh, you can see there that there is um, so we've uh, reduced the set of time by half over this, uh, these first 10 patients. Um, there, is, there was still a lot of fluctuation within each patient though. For example, the most recent patient, patient 10 there, uh, had a set of time range of between four minutes and 34 minutes. Um, so there's a lot of fluctuation. Um, so review time, cone beam review times. Um, interestingly, that has increased over these 10 patients. Uh, we'll discuss the reasons for that a bit more later. And then the total treatment times um, has fallen slightly from 50 minutes to 40 minutes. Uh, now these are just the VAT bag patients, so they do tend to take a little bit longer than our, our other patients, um, but uh, we'll discuss a bit more about the, um, the reason why they were taking that amount of time a little bit later. Okay, moving on to the displacement results. So this is just looking at the 3D image, just the cone beam CT data. Um, so we used our action tolerances, uh, so within the department as well, we have uh, action tolerances of one centimeter and two degrees. So they're the um, measurements that, or the tolerances that a radiographer can apply before they need more senior involvement. So I've used those tolerances to uh, display the results. Uh, and as you can see that 100% of the translational measurements were within those tolerances, which is good. Um, the rotational measurements were slightly different story, more variable, uh, didn't reach 100% for any of them. Um, if, if the measurements are out of toll, like they were sometimes here, then we would, we would assess on an individual basis, get more senior people involved. Um, but in, but um, the maximum that we can correct for on the six degree of freedom bed is three degrees, and overall 99.8% of rotational measurements were within that. So that's still pretty good. Okay, image agreements. So we wanted to see 
how viable it was to move from 3D to just doing 2D. So we went doing 3D every single day. So we looked at how agreeable 2D was with 3D. So for the initial 2D to the um, subsequent cone beam, we used a bland Altman plot, which is a method for analyzing the agreement between two different data sets. This showed that 95% of the time, the gross error check, that initial 2D would be within about three millimeters of the cone beam. Uh, that's for translation, translational measurements. Um, the rotational results were more varied and showed that in the pitch, the 2D image would underestimate the 3D image slightly and overestimate the role slightly, almost by to a degree at, at some points. Uh, this is sort of creeping into the area of uh, not being that acceptable. Um, so we've got something in place now where we assess, uh, when we're doing our systematic review, we also assess the agree agreement between 2D and 3D to see whether they can proceed on um, the standard 2D imaging protocol or they should um, stay on daily cone beam. Uh, we also looked at um, the cone beam versus the final 2D and how agreeable they were. Um, so once you applied your move from the cone beam, you would expect in a perfect world for the, when you take your 2D image, for the bed to be, for the measurements to be zero. Um, that's not always the case. Um, we can see that the overall agreement there for translations was 89% and 94% for rotations. And interestingly, it was much more compliant with the GA patients rather than non-GA, which would imply that it was more down to very small patient movements uh, rather than the bed not going to the right position, which is reassuring. Um, so, a bit of discussion, timings are improving. Yeah, so to go back to why uh, the timings were taken um, that amount of time. It was a new service. We had a lot of sort of daily issues, a lot of uncertainty about how um, how what we were seeing on the images would be would translate into the dosimetric effect. So we were getting the physics and the clinician involved quite a bit at the beginning. Um, it was also a brand new service, so there's a lot of training going on that that obviously delays uh, things, um, and quite quite a bit of patient reset up as well. So to achieve that 100%. Um, translationals uh, within uh, tolerance. Uh, we had over the whole course of those patients and all the, all the fractions, we had 38 reset ups to, to get to that. Um, displacements, um, we were happy with the displacements, so they were in acceptable limits. And the image agreements, um, they're fine for translations, but um, the rotation's a bit more um, variable. So like I said before, um, at the systematic review to assess that. So in conclusion, back bags, they are suitable, but we need to have the systematic review to look at the 2D and 3D agreements. We need a 60 degree of freedom of couch uh, to make sure that the, uh, all the rotations and everything are applied to make sure that we, that we can accurately position the patient for treatment. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. Great, that's great work, Dave. So Dave's work was, this is his poster that was due to be presented at Astro this year as well. Um, so I'm glad he's had the opportunity to present it here. The next up is John Rogers, who's our ArtNet research radiographer, who's been uh, absolutely instrumental in helping us set up the MR Linac, and he's going to talk about a little bit of work that he's led. It's the PowerPoint. Uh, great slide. Okay. Hi, uh, yeah, sorry, yes, um, as Cynthia said, my name's John, I'm the RNA radiographer. Um, so yeah, the MR Linac, it's a, it's a new device, it's a research machine, and it's essential that those operating provide evidence of its effectiveness. And there's been a focus on radiographers leading research on the machine. Um, these studies need to be sophisticated enough to provide uh, relevant evidence for our practice and, and, the, and the care of patients. And, and like, like most things on the MR Linac, it's proven to be a pretty steep learning curve. So um, yeah, uh, MR guided radiotherapy, it's introduced MR to CT image registration uh, into, into the workflow. It requires radiographers um, to be proficient in both interpreting MR images and registering them to a reference uh, image accurately and efficiently. Before our first, prost uh, first prostate patient uh, last May, the, the three radiographers uh, who were working on EMR LIDAC wanted some assurance that we were in it with a novel imaging modality, we were all doing the same thing. So we ran a small exercise to confirm that our registration agreement was acceptable and the results are really reassuring and compared, compared well with work uh, on cone beam registration in the department. So our 
Our next treatment area is we cervix. Can't, um, we can't see your slides. Well, I can't see them anyway. Sorry. All right. Oh. I think it's still on the PDF page for Lisa. Oh, is it you share? Yeah. How about now? Any better? Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Thanks, Rosie. Cheers for that. Nice heads up. <laughs> 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 yeah, so um, we were, our new area is a uh, treatment area, will be the cervix. It's uh, potentially a, a more challenging area for accurate target registration. And the rectal and bladder changes uh, can lead to um, it would be good if this worked. Yeah. Um, uh, they can they can lead to certainly uh, changes in the target positioning and um, quite a challenging uh, situation day to day. So uh, we did feel it was important to quantify image registration agreement, and um, we wanted to establish that prior to implementing Cervix's new clinical site for MR guided radiotherapy that uh, MR registration was comparable to established cone beam CT processes. Uh, we had a secondary aim as well and that was to identify elements of the registration process where further uh, training would be of benefit for, for the radiographers. Um, so how we went about it, well um, we were fortunate enough to have uh, uh, on treatment and MR images from 10 patients in the previous study uh, five therapy radiographers with some experience at least of MR and Monaco participated. Uh, they matched cone beam and MRs taken on the same day with reference CT planning scans and also matched MR to MR using the earliest MR uh, that we had as, as the reference image. Um, as far as the results go, we looked at inter-observer variation between the MR, CT and cone beam CT registration and the results are very similar really. There was very little difference and kind of sort of led us to the conclusion that registering an MR is at least no worse than uh, using cone beam. And uh, to evaluate um, consistency of agreement, well, yeah, we used bland Altman. We used uh, modified bland Altman plots. And uh, this process, as you've seen from David's uh, little talk, establishes limits of agreement. And these can, can be compared to a threshold. And uh, to assess uh, clinical significance, uh, we, we opted for a threshold set of five millimeters which is kind of based on our departmental ITV to PTV expansion margin for Embrace 2 patients. Um, it's quite a busy uh, slide this, but basically limits of agreement were consistent for three registration strategies in the right left <coughs> and the soup in um, in the soup in third directions, whilst MR to MR registration demonstrated an improved uh, limits of agreement between observers compared to cone beam and MR to CT in the, in the AMP post. Um, cone beam CT and MR CT uh, limits of uh, agreement exceeded uh, the predefined clinical acceptable threshold we, we set at five millimeters in that AMP post direction. So the, the obvious benefit that MR has, which is, uh, we've seen it while we're treating, which is far superior soft tissue contrast, appears not to readily translate to improvements in inter-observer agreement when we're registering uh, images. So we're trying to think why that might be. Well, the lack of, um, lack of experience when interpreting and, and aligning MR images to CT may account for some of the inconsistency. Another poss possibility is that that broadly similar appearance of cone beam and CT that we're all used to, guides observer registration and improves uh, agreement. So <clears throat> as radiographers, the results were disappointing. Um, to say MR guided radiotherapy is no worse than cone beam CT didn't strike us as particularly satisfactory. Neither did this AMP post level agreement exceeding the, the threshold of five millimeters. We looked at potential weaknesses of the study and identified that maybe how we'd instructed observers to match the images um, as a possible flaw, because uh, whilst they'd all undergone an MR anatomy session um, for the cervix with a clinician, they'd only been instructed to match the cervix. Um, therefore, our next step was to introduce a registration protocol manual and validate it, or at least attempt to validate it, in order to uh, improve radiographer agreement during image registration for cervix uh, MR guided radiotherapy. 
Uh, so we repeated the registration following the creation of a registration guide. Um, this, is, this is an example of it. Uh, the guide was developed collaboratively between therapeutic and diagnostic MR radiographers in consultation with clinicians to identify the most relevant anatomical uh, regions for registration in an attempt to standardize the process. Uh, the manual was used as guidance uh, in the repeat registrations and, and the results, well, there were improvements in all planes, but that most notably in the AMP post plane, which previously had had the largest variation. Um, so that was uh, really rewarding, to be honest. Uh, the study confirmed that the application of this guidance manual resulted in significant improvement in inter-observer agreements, at least with the participants included uh, within it. But um, to truly validate the results, we need to, it needs to be replicated with radiographers without experience of MR image registration of the cervix, and, and we're working towards that at the present. However, this work is already becoming outdated as we're intru introducing MR to MR registration on the MR LINAC, and I think it emphasizes that research is highly dynamic within the uh, radiotherapy environment at present, and particularly with the ad advent of MR LINAC and the new possibilities that arise from it. So it's important for us as, as researchers uh, involved with that to be as smart and innovative as possible to stay ahead of the curve. Uh, that's it, actually. Are you done? I'm done. Perfect. That's really great work, John. Um, and thanks for the very nice summary. So I think our last speaker of this session is uh, Rosie Hales. She's a research radiographer who works on Amar Lanak with us at the Christie, and she's going to present um, a little bit of her recent work. Rosie, are you ready to share your screen? Yes. Um, do, I want, do I need John to stop sharing his first? Sorry. I think you can just say share screen, no? Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay, can you see that my slides okay? Yep. Ah, okay, so uh, yeah, as Cynthia said, I'm Rosie Hales and I'm just going to talk about treatments on the MR Linac and how radiographer led research is helping to increase efficiency in our treatment delivery. So, for those of you who might not be aware, um, MR Linacs are hybrid systems which combine an MR scanner with a linear accelerator. And the elector unity is the MLNAC that we have uh, installed here at the Christie. So each fraction delivered on the unity is an adapted fraction. And this is supported, as others have mentioned, by superior soft tissue contrast of MR over Conbeam and um, standard CT. Uh, this brings with it the necessity to establish new ways of working. Um, the unity is capable of adapting daily fractions online while the patient's on the bed. And this is following two different work streams. The first adapts for daily positional changes, which is akin to a virtual couch shift, where the plan is moved to fit the patient. And this is known as adapt position or ATP. The second work stream allows for adaptation for daily variations in anatomy. Um, and in this work stream, recontouring of targets and organs at risk and online replanning is required. And this is known as adapt to shape. In both work streams, the responsibilities of the frontline staff delivering the treatments can differ slightly. So at the Christie, we began treating in May last year, and this was following adapt position for prostate patients receiving 20 fractions. These treatments are by nature resource intensive due to the various steps involved. Um, this diagram um, shows the various steps involved from adapt, delivering adapt position fraction from top to bottom. And here you can see the various disciplines that step in at different points um, at our institution. So for an ATP fraction, for our first two patients that we had at the Christie, we had the full complement of five staff present for treatment. This is two therapeutic radiographers, two physicists and one clinician. Um, so as you, as you can see, each plays a role at different points. And the average room time for these treatments was 36 and a half minutes. The responsibilities of the therapeutic reds involved in the uh, delivery of these fractions include safe setup, image acquisition, um, image registration and treatment delivery. And these core responsibilities are the same as for standard CBCT guided treatment, albeit with a um, bit of a step change in the technology used. So this led us to believe that with the acquisition of some extra skills, these uh, adaptive radiotherapy fractions lend themselves to being um, uh, radiographer led 
and this would offer a more sustainable solution for integration into a radiotherapy department. So in terms of methods, the first step was to identify the skills required by the therapeutic radiographers to lead these treatments on the MLNAC. And these uh, skills here are those required for an adaptive position fraction. The green skills represent those that are standard for combing CT guided treatment, so setup and delivery. The amber skills, CT MR registration, treatment plan preparation, evaluation, and check in, are within the scope of practice of a therapeutic radiographer. But these represent additional skills for our radiographers who do not uh, rotate into treatment planning as standard. The red skills are outside the scope of practice currently of a UK uh, uh, therapeutic radiographer, such as MR image interpretation acquisition. So once these skills are identified, these were acquired through various different methods, such as attending external courses, uh, internal courses, tutorials, discussions, self-directed learning, and teaching your colleagues. Um, as others have mentioned, in interdisciplinary discussions have been key to this uh, research. Um, and these were required all the members of the treatment team regarding how responsibilities should change in order for these, these treatments to become radio for lead. Um, it's worth noting that small steps may be needed according to local resource and policies. So our first step at the Christie was to introduce a clinician light way of working where the, where the clinician is on standby and only contacted if needed. And this is to um, reduce the resources required for treatment. Following up on these discussions, clear action thresholds needed to be identified and agreed uh, for contacting the clinician on call and for taking certain steps. And these needed to be well documented producing a clear frame of working that all stakeholders could follow. So um, this was our initial workflow for the first two patients treated at the Christie. And following this method, a clinician light frame of working was developed for prostate adapt position treatment. So this was moving the clinician to an on-call position. Uh, this clinician light framework is shown here in B. So the same steps um, were involved in the treatment, but the responsibilities of the radiographers and physicists have expanded um, and the doctor has moved to an on-call position. So 10 patients were treated following this workflow and the timings of certain steps were recorded and compared to the first two patients. Following the framework, a clinician was required to attend for 1.5% of fraction before reviewing dose criteria online. In terms of actual time taken, a reduction in time can be seen for certain steps in the workflow where the responsibilities have changed and for overall in-room time as well. Um, and this has continued to decrease um, through treatment delivery. A degree of this reduction can obviously be attributed to um, everyone involved being more familiar now with the software and the treatment process, but hopefully it demonstrates that we've implemented a more streamlined treatment workflow and a better use of resources. Uh, in the near future, the appropriately trained MRL radiographers will be taking over the role of the first physicist and undertaking simple online treatment planning for these adaptive position fractions, which will further improve the use of resources and reduce the staff uh, required for a fraction to be delivered. And this new workflow is shown in C, uh, with two radiographers and one physicist present for treatment. Uh, in the future, we'll also be introducing the adapter shape workflow, which, as I described earlier, um, involves an extra recontouring step and online planning is more complex. In order for this also, also to become clinician light in the future and for radiographers to expand their responsibilities in order to pave the way for more radiographer led treatments, after initial, ex initial experience of patients there must again be um, significant interdisciplinary discussions um, feeding into identifying and agreeing new action thresholds that are appropriate for this, this treatment technique. Um, as well as significant time spent on gaining additional competencies such as online, co online contouring and complex planning. So in conclusion, this clinician light adapt position workflow uh, developed here is one step towards radiographer led MR guided adaptive radiotherapy delivery, which we've shown to be more efficient and has allowed role expansion for those involved. And it's more akin to standard CP CBCT guided radiotherapy delivery. Implementation of this required agreed and clear thresholds um, and for implementation of any other sites or for more advanced treatments, further um, inter interdisciplinary discussions will be required. And just just a few acknowledgements to everyone involved. <laughs>
not there. Thank you. That's great, Rosie. Um, thanks very much. And thanks to all four of our speakers. So we have some time. And again, I'd like to encourage people to give me some questions through chat or if you're impatient, just shout something out. If all four of the speakers can make themselves available to answer some questions. Questions can be either specific to the project or more about how they, the research radiographers balance their time um, or in their experiences. Um, anybody have the first question? If not, um, I'll go. So I think, uh, Dave, I'll start with you because you're not currently working in a research role. So how are you finding uh, the desire to get some research done and the ability to balance it with your clinical job? It, well, when I was doing this project, it was quite easy because it was partly, it was when the service was ramping up. So we didn't have that many patients. So we did have a lot of spare time to do these sort of projects. I'd say now, but if I to attempt to do something like this now, I'd probably find it very, very difficult. Uh, it did take a lot of time. Okay, good. Um, Dr. Professor Chaudhry says, how easy or hard is it to research your own ideas? Um, anybody want to tackle that question? I'll pick on people if you don't volunteer. <laughs> Okay, Lisa, I can see you thinking, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting a sentence together. <laughs> I'm engaging brain before. <clears throat> I think it's a good, it's an easy environment to discuss ideas with um, lots of other disciplines. Obviously, you've got to bear in mind um, for us on the Molinac or our first concern is research that involves the MLNAC and, and patients as well. So it's, you know, it depends on what area you're in, but I think it's um, a good environment to be able to discuss with a lot of the other disciplines and get ideas from them and to collaborate with other people as well. I'm going to take that as a general consensus because I don't see anybody grimacing too much. <laughs> um, John, Professor Van Herk has a question for you. He says, interesting that setup and review takes quite so long. Oh, maybe it's for David, sorry. Interesting that setup and review takes quite so long on protons. Have you compared to similar pediatric setup on photon machines and why is it different? Uh, no, I haven't yet. Um, I think the reason why these the, uh, setups and imaging was so long was because of the, um, it was a new service and there was lots of uncertainties with everyone there about the dosimetric impact of what we were seeing on the cone beams. Um, so we had to get a lot of um, a lot of help to make those decisions about where to go ahead for treatment or reset up. Um, looking at like the service now, and I can only say from what I've seen and you know working within the service now, we're a lot quicker, we're a lot slicker. Um, the, a general VAT bag patient will probably take no more than 30 minutes for setup and, and treatment. Uh, and CNS patients, uh, you know, like um, patients in a mask, uh, 20 minutes. And that, that's more, more standard to what, what we're working with now. Great. And John, Professor Van Herk does have a question for you. He said, would the same guidance document also been helpful in uh, CT to CVCT guidance? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, we're wondering whether it could be translated over to, to cone beam, really. Um, obviously, the, one of the issues about this document would be that, you know, it's looking at a particular organ. And when we're, when we're reviewing, we're, we're not um, online. We, we, considering organs at risk and all PTVs and but uh, certainly it's something we're considering for things uh, upper abdominal work which is quite difficult and challenging in in uh, cone beam and uh, also with the advent of uh, prostate saver as well that that's another uh, thing that, that we're certainly talking about whether we can have some specific guidance consensus agreement which uh, will which shouldn't be done, um, you know, in isolation. It will involve other uh, elements of guidance and, you know, discussion with, with uh, more experienced radiographers. But at least give people a good idea of what they, what's expected, what thresholds, and what and what kind of uh, imaging strategy they uh, need to do. So, yeah. Great, uh, Rosie. There's a question for you. It says you mentioned um, it's good to work with the MDT teams on the projects. Do you find uh, many of you need to get further support, such as from statistical analysis, and if yes, where do you get the support from? Um, 
Yeah, so there are statisticians that we can talk to at the Christie, but we also have regular meetings with um, uh, the academic research team um, who offer advice as we need it for projects really. So it's, it's quite a nice collaborative atmosphere. Um, and there's also, if you, you know, meetings where you listen on other people's projects, you often find the answers for your own as well. So that's my experience. I haven't had to use statistics official statistician support yet but <laughs> i'm sure i will soon john and david you both have for your projects i believe yes yes yeah yeah absolutely um, and one final question from prof Chaudhry. this is to everyone uh the project work going on in the christie is what we've been discussing but how will we find out what's going on at other centers well, we discuss things and you know we try yeah. we try and we i mean we've built links with uh, the mr linak in, in royal marsden for example and you know that, that kind of uh <clears throat> obviously have the artnet meetings as well which is really helpful in that respect and that you get to meet the other artnet radiographers so there's a there's a networking opportunities and, and collaboration through that um and uh yeah i mean that's that's one aspect uh, anyone else what about, what about the big thing that we're just missing out on? You all are going to present at ESTRO. I was going to say ESTRO, yeah. Um, yeah. Networking and getting posters out to, um, and then um, you, you see what the other groups are doing, all the, even the society conference, and you see what other groups are doing, and then you, make, you, you see something that interests you, and you make contact with them that way. Mike, Mike. Uh, Mike Velick is plugging RTT conferences, so I think that's specifically the RTI 3 conference that they hold every year in Toronto. It's a radiotherapist specific uh, meeting, um, which I don't think any of our team outside of myself have yet to attend, but um, it's good. Uh, again, from Prof Chaudhry, do any of you think social media such as Twitter is useful for communicating? It's nice to it, it's nice to see fa uh, names that you know, um, and I think a lot of the um, not not really therapy related, but but a lot of the COVID related research, for example, some of some of that's been really interesting on Twitter, um, and just to see what the other groups are doing. What about things like the MedRed Journal Club, like the Twitter Journal Club? <laughs> uh, yes, we're, we're, we we joined in the Medrod Journal Club. That's every month. Um, that that was an experience. That was interesting, and it's good to see different viewpoints from around the world of different practices in different countries, <clears throat> and how similar similar it is. Great. Well, I'll let you guys off the hook now. Thank you very much for presenting and for all your hard work as always. Um, I think I'm up next to give a quick overview of our PhD Academy and then we've got about 20-25 minutes for um, general discussion if anyone wants to stick around. Um, just let me find my presentation. It's a, RADNET program. It's, a, it's a large program that's been through CRUK here at the Christie um, with four main themes and, uh, or sorry, three main themes of four hubs. And what we're interested in talking about today briefly is our doctoral academy hub. So we're within the framework of this project, we're trying to, de to develop uh, academic radiographers um, at, by providing funding for PhDs um, through our university doctoral program. We are doing other work in other areas, but today is mainly to launch our PhD program, which is now open for, um, for applications and so we have two funded PhD projects that are being offered this fall. One is on image guidance optimization for upper GI cancers and the second one is the evaluation of motion management strategies across multiple radiotherapy platforms. Your supervisory teams are made up of um, various professors and doctors, it's multidisciplinary teams, and um, also leads in our hub, Professor York and Dr. Burnett will be available to become uh, academic advisors um, to support you through your PhD. So these are two uh, non-clinical PhDs um, based on the CRUK um, definition. So they're four years, they're full time, uh, 
full-time PhDs at University of Manchester does permit you to work up to 20 hours a week, uh, provided it's agreed with your supervisors and it does not delay the submission of your project. We have general uh, entry requirements that are similar to all entry requirements at the University of Manchester, but we've also uh, put in the requirement that we would prefer people to be registered or eligible for registration with the HCPC, so to be an AHP. Um, the projects are clearly um, biased towards being a radiographer, uh, but we would be willing to accept other AHP. The projects will focus on using that technology to deliver precise precise radiotherapy in uh, the upper abdomen, uh, so liver, pancreas, kidney, lower esophagus, uh, specifically across the proton and MR Lanac platforms. We want to sort of look at how we can overcome and triage the most appropriate radiotherapy uh, delivery for these patients, mitigating challenges associated with motion or imaging. And then we want to investigate patient and population-based models um, and strategies that would lead to the development of clinical trials in these tumor sites. Um, so how do you apply? You can go online, you can go to the University of Manchester website, look at the biology, medicine and health uh, webpage and um, re re research and funded programs at this link. When you get there, you, there'll be a checklist where you can find out if you're eligible to apply. Um, we'll detail the stipend and the um, studentship, what the studentship will cover. You then choose a project. So you'll cut a page that says find a project. You click on find a project. There's funded projects and funding opportunities. You click on funded project and the two projects will appear. You can click on for more details and that will take you further through the application process. So you then would register to apply. You create an application. You look for my name as your choice of supervisor because my name is what's linked to the two projects. Although there will be other supervisors to support the projects. Um, and then you will submit your documentation. So you fill out the online form and you'll also need to include a personal statement, two references, any certificates or transcripts that you may have, a CV. You'll need to check off uh, the language requirements, so English language speakers, um, and you'll receive an acknowledgement. The deadline for the application is close. It's May 24th of this year. You'll get a uh, notification and then we will ask you to interview. Um, the interview will most likely be uh, via Zoom or Teams or Google Meets. It will be a virtual interview, not an in-person interview. Um, and we'll give you instructions about what we will expect to happen in the interview. And that will happen on June 16th with this year. Um, and then this is just the program once again. And if you have any questions, uh, you're thinking of applying, but you're not sure about the logistics, do get in touch. I would encourage you to apply even if you're not sure about the logistics because then at least you're in our system, you've registered some interests and we can um, discuss things with you. And with that, I'm just gonna open up the floor and ask um, any of our uh, panelists who are available to turn on the mic. Right, so any questions about the PhD or any questions to any of our speakers? Uh, oh, Georgie has just let me know that our deadline has been extended to the 26th of May. So that's two extra days for you to work on your application. So the goal of today was to plug our, our new PhD and at doctoral academy, but it was also to provide a networking opportunity, connect to people with different people uh, who are at different points in their research pathway. I hope we've done that. Um, and I hope the you know, people who have any questions will stick around and ask. No quick typers. Uh, so Peter Merkin says, are you happy for applications from diagnostic radiographers with MR experience? Yes, absolutely, Peter. Uh, all radiographers. Um, we're, we're happy for all radiographers, all AHPs in fact. Uh, Jenna, would the PhD applicants need to relocate to Manchester or could some work be done remotely? Ideally we'd have you in Manchester, uh, but again I would say apply and see what comes of discussions. Um, Bethany, Will this session be available to rewatch at another time? Uh, yes, I believe it's being recorded. We just have to double check that no, none of the speakers do not want their presentations um, published, but we will be publishing it on the MCRC website at some time in the near future.
Um, any other questions for any of our speakers? Or about the PhDs? Uh, Joseph Clark, our communications officer, has just said, for anyone interested in the PhD positions, they can be found on the CRUK Manchester website. So that's www.crukcenter.manchester.ac.uk. Um, and that's in the chat, so take a quick look at the chat. Uh, Stephanie Hill, is candidate suitability more focused towards recently graduated slash currently practicing therapeutic radiographers, or is it simply preferable for applicants to have a qualification degree? Um, we're looking for AHPs and we're looking for radiographer AHPs. So I think a strong candidate, uh, it will depend on the whole picture. Uh, some, in some cases, it may be stronger to have more experience. In some cases, it may be, you may have a strong application if you're a new radiographer. So I think if you're interested, please apply. Um, are there any radiotherapy, genomics, biology related PhD opportunities in the near future? So now, yes, not in these two projects at the moment, but yes. Um, any upcoming projects will appear on our website um, and the um, CRC Twitter page. So if you don't already follow us, do follow us at MCRC. Um, MCRC News is the handle. I'll stay on the line for a little bit longer, um, but if uh, there's no other questions, thank you very much for attending and thank you again very much to our speakers. Uh, Peter Merkin, to what extent will outcomes be measured by such techniques as radiomics, example, qualitative MRI as well? And it's a very good question. So that's an area of research we're very keen to work on. And, and I think it would depend a little bit on the candidate, as you can probably tell from the projects that are a little bit broad. Um, so we're looking for the candidate to sort of help us lead what area they're most interested in and how we will do that. Uh, thank you, Helen McNair, for, um, for joining us and for giving us your time and your experience. If you do have further questions, do get in touch and we can put you in touch with the appropriate speaker or, um, or set up a time to chat with you. Thank you, Yat. Thank you, Ashley. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for sharing and good luck with your applications. Sharon, will there be any specified project outlines ready to apply for or are the opportunities to create? So Sharon, we do have two projects advertised online. Um, I'll just share my screen again with you. So it's um, these two projects at the moment, image guidance for optimization of radiotherapy of upper GI cancers or the evaluation of motion management strategies. And they can be found at this website here. I'll leave it up there for a minute. You can um, write it, but if you have other ideas, uh, we can certainly discuss and look for funding opportunities.